Arcane Magic is Book 6 in the Daughters of the Warlock series. Written by Maggie Shaw. Published by Harley Romance Publishing, 2022. Chapter 1. Bella. Waking up in bed next to a shifter could be interesting. One morning I'd open my eyes to find Christian sleeping right next to me, where he was meant to be. In wolf form. That had given me one hell of a fright. I admit that I screamed a little at the time, but I was getting more comfortable with the animal elements of my lover as time wore on. There were nuances I wasn't even familiar with. Not only could he shift forms while sleeping, but he whined in his sleep and didn't use the covers because his body ran at a higher temperature than humans. Which was perfect for me, considering when the nights got cold I could share some of his heat. That, and I didn't have to worry about him hogging the blankets. Good morning, Christian said from his side of our bed, and I rolled over to smile at him. I wasn't sure I'd ever get used to this. Hey. How'd you sleep? He stretched out, reaching his arms above his head and groaning loudly. Too well. I feel so pampered in this bed, living in this house with you. He rolled over to face me and I leaned forward, kissing his lips and sighing with contentment. It should be illegal to feel this happy. I murmured more to myself than to him. Christian laughed and rolled out of bed to use the bathroom. It is. They call it living in sin for a reason. I giggled as I pulled up the blankets to cover my naked body. Christian preferred I didn't wear pajamas, especially if we'd had sex the night before. Which was pretty much every night. He was a voracious lover, something I wasn't used to but was enthusiastic about nonetheless. Part of me wondered if it had to do with him being a wolf, but part of me believed Christian would always have a healthy sexual appetite, no matter what sort of creature he was. I happened to be the lucky recipient of his attention, and I had no plans to deny him any time soon. Especially since my own appetite for it, for him, was just as enthusiastic. Yeah. I smiled to myself. If this luxury was a sin, then make me a sloth. I wanted to enjoy loving Christian for as long as I breathe. For as long as we could make this work. I wasn't a silly girl who thought we'd be together forever. I also saw no reason for us to stop anytime soon. I wanted to believe, but it wouldn't do to think about my mother's sordid history and her own hang-ups with men, especially my father. Just because she behaved a certain way didn't mean it was my destiny. What time do you finish work today? He asked, walking back into the room. His hands were still damp, having just washed them. Do you want me to pick you up? It had been almost six months since the attack on Courtney and me in the library, and yet Christian and my father still worried about our safety. I couldn't blame them. I still worried about Courtney as well. And since we had yet to discover who was behind that attack, I didn't fight them on what could be construed as overprotectiveness. I'd do the same thing. I finish around three, but you don't need to pick me up. Ava's meeting me, and we're going shopping for baby things. I mean, unless you want to help us pick out the perfect crib. My sister was ready to pop. Ava was one of those perfect pregnant women who had flawless skin and an iridescent glow. Her hair shined. I could only hope if I ever decided to have a child, I would have inherited a fraction of those qualities too. Christian grinned at me as he got dressed, readying himself for his day as a farmer, builder and general maintenance man for the wolf shifter town. My father had built the whole place in one night, but it required ongoing support, and we'd had hundreds of refugees coming in from other cities and realms. It certainly kept Christian busy while I spent my days at the library in town and Christian was passionate about his job. People loved him. How long's she got now? He asked casually, pulling on a black t-shirt and blue overalls. We hadn't talked much about pregnancy in general, but his curiosity made me grin. About six weeks, I think. I groaned as I joined him, rolling out of bed to start my day. I had to get moving, or I was in danger of becoming the sloth I joked about. For a moment, he did nothing but stare as I stretched. The old me would have felt self-conscious of his heady gaze, 
would have questioned why his eyes darkened as they sculpted the length of my body. Even now, despite our intimate experiences, a warmth tickled my cheek, and I knew I was blushing. Instead of moving to cover myself or rushing to pull on clothes, I allowed myself to enjoy his perusal. And maybe if we didn't have to leave so soon, we might have been rolling back in bed for one more romp before we started the day. It woke me up better than coffee. I don't think I'll ever get used to this, he murmured, shaking his head before running his fingers through his hair. I love that he seemed to echo my sentiments exactly. Breakfast, he asked, walking over to our small kitchen. Scrambled eggs and toast. My specialty. He gave me a wink. I moved across the room, shivering in the cool morning air and dashing to the bathroom. Oh yes please. Okay. You take a shower, and it will be ready when you're out. Christian went about preparing the meal, when I could have snapped my fingers and done it for us. The fact that he enjoyed looking after me, and took pride in things like cooking, made me love him so much more. I jumped in the shower, enjoying the quiet and the warmth before dressing with a magical wave of my hand. Black leggings, a long burgundy tunic and a gray cardigan because it was cold. I matched the outfit with some flat leather knee-high boots, and I was ready to go. Breakfast was on the round wooden table that served as the dining table in the kitchen. You're the best. You know that? I said, sitting down to my plate and reaching for the orange juice he'd poured for me. I grabbed my fork to eat, and Christian pushed a small box across the table towards me. I frowned at it, then picked it up. It was black and square and weighed very little. What's this, oh my? Christian was kneeling beside the table, staring up at me. I wanted to do this in a romantic moment, but what better time than right now? My throat tightened and I stared down at him. Are you? I'd seen marriage proposals on the human television shows we'd been allowed to watch on occasion. But he couldn't possibly be doing that. Christian took the box from my hand and opened it. Bella Melfi, would you marry me? Make me the happiest of men by agreeing to be my wife. I launched myself at him, knocking him to the ground and kissing him as hard as I could. He laughed against my lips, rolling so I was beneath him, and lifted his head. Is that a yes? I nodded, my throat tightening with emotion. Yes please. I'd love to be your wife. As a woman who'd never believed that I'd ever find someone who suited me, I couldn't believe how perfect Christian was. He slid back, got to his feet and pulled me up as well. Then you should wear your ring. He bent down and scooped up the box that had been lost in my flurry of kissing activity. He opened the box and showed me the ring he'd chosen. I'd expected a plain diamond or a gold band. But instead inside the box was a silver ring with a large purple stone. It was engraved and ornate, and so much more beautiful than any ring I'd ever seen. Christian. I whispered. It's perfect. He plucked the ring from its bed and reached for my left hand. I was hoping you'd like it. I designed the style and one of my friends made it for me. You have a jewelry-making friend I don't know about. Christian laughed. I do have some secrets still. He slid the ring onto my finger, and it fit snugly at the base near my knuckle. Christian leaned forward and cupped my chin, lifting my face for another sweet kiss. Now I have to go to work, and so do you. I grabbed his arm, dragging him back to me. You don't want to celebrate now. I could never get enough of his gorgeous body, or the way he touched me. Christian raised an eyebrow. You want to blow off the library? I pressed my lips together. No, I didn't. Our lovemaking sessions were long. I wouldn't be dressed and ready for work again for hours. I glanced at the clock on the wall, then looked back to Christian, who was smirking. I didn't think so. We can celebrate tonight. Sounds great. He gave me one more kiss before we walked out the front door of our house together. Morning, Bella. Monique said as she walked by. Morning. I waved as the wolf shifter walked by. I'd done my best to fit into the wolf shifter community. Some of the older men were still a little guarded but overall, I loved living in the Packlands and they seemed to like having me there. Okay, gotta go. 
I said, kissing my official fiancé one more time, then dancing off down the path towards the exit to the realm. My father had created a special type of barrier that only allowed approved people into the Packlands. Since we'd discovered council members whipping Christian in a public arena, Dad had stepped up and protected the wolf shifters. He'd created this community and put barriers up for them. I slipped through the invisible shield and stepped into the warlock town. The library was a ten-minute walk, but I hurried as I was late. My new ring felt cool and heavy on my hand. Foreign and new, in the best way. He asked me to marry him. I still couldn't believe it. Even as I stared down on the ring on my finger, it still seemed surreal. What sort of wedding would we have? Some type of pack ritual? Or a fancy ceremony like Ava had? Speaking of Ava, what was she going to say tonight when I told her? What would Courtney think? Hopefully, both would be happy for me. I reached the college for witches and warlocks and raced into the front entrance. It was weird to think that my sisters and I would have gone to school here if our mother hadn't hidden us in another realm for twenty years. Or would we? Would we even be alive today if someone had discovered that the High Warlock had fathered three daughters to a woman who wasn't his wife? And with that strange thought in my head, I pushed open the door to the library and raced over to the reception desk. Morning, Hillary. Good morning, Bella. Sleep in again. Heat flushed up my cheeks. Tardiness had never been a problem before I started living with Christian. Now I slept in more mornings than I could count. Um yeah. Sorry, Hillary. She grinned at me, and I ducked my head and ran off to the back of the library, where I could start my sorting and hide my flaming cheeks. I loved Christian, but I didn't love the idea of everyone else knowing how smitten we were with each other. Mostly because they put two and two together, and realized I spent a lot more time in bed than I should. The day, like most, passed quickly. The library was exactly my sort of place, filled with my sort of people. Bookworms. Hardworking, quiet types. When 3 p.m. rolled around, I was just logging out of the computer when Ava waddled into the room. I couldn't stop the smile that lifted my lips and lit my heart. You look so beautiful, pregnant. Her blonde hair shined like the sun and her huge round belly was wrapped up in a gray knit dress. I thought she looked amazing. My sister, however, did not agree with me. She pushed her hand into her lower back and groaned. I cannot wait for this to be over. I chuckled, grabbed my purple and gold satchel and headed for the front door. Bye, Hillary. See you tomorrow. How's Courtney? I asked as I opened the door for my sister, and we made our way out of the college. Ava sighed again. She's okay, I guess. She still has strange blackouts and her temper isn't great. It never was, I countered, memories of Courtney's temperament throughout childhood coming across my mind. Ava held the railing as she walked down the few steps to the ground, then waddled through the gates. I was thinking of going into town and visiting Josie. She has the most beautiful baby blankets. I grinned. Sounds great. I couldn't believe that my sister was going to be a mother. I was going to be an aunt. We wandered along the road and when we reached Josie's shop, I reached out and opened the door for her. Ava froze halfway through the door, staring at where my hand held the door open. She snatched at my fingers, staring down at my left hand. Bella. What is this? My stomach twisted at her tone. She sounded angry with me. It's my engagement ring, I whispered. Christian asked me to marry him this morning. I still couldn't believe it. It was a shock. Partly because I never thought I wanted to get married, but also partly because I didn't think anyone would see me as potential wife material. I wasn't as charming as Courtney or as beautiful as Ava. I was a quiet librarian sort and preferred it that way. And yet, Christian seemed to be able to see past all of that. He recognized me for who I really was. I glanced up from staring at my ring again to look at my sister, my heart skipping a beat. The look on Ava's face I'd never forget. Horror transforming into pity. But Bella. 
I thought you knew. You can't. Chapter 2 Bella I pulled back my hand and placed it on my chest over my heart, which was thumping like a bongo drum. Surely I couldn't have heard her right. I had to be mistaken. There was no way she just said, What do you mean I can't? This had to be one of her jokes. Maybe pregnancy brain was eating away at her rationality. And she liked Christian. Had told me so multiple times over the past six months and seemed to eagerly support our relationship. Ava pressed her lips together and inhaled deeply through her nose. Ah, let's walk and talk. She slid her arm through mine and hooked me into her side, the blanket and baby clothes shopping forgotten. This couldn't be good. Ava wasn't one to attempt to be so diplomatic. For the most part, she just came right out and said exactly what she felt. I indulged her for a while, strolling along the shop fronts in silence. She obviously wanted to go somewhere quieter for this conversation, but I could only last so long. My head was churning with negative thoughts and my stomach was twisted into knots. And I deserved to understand why my own sister would say something so terribly cruel, and then drag it out for as long as she could. When we reached a small park with a bench in the center beneath a large tree, I pointed at it and said as calmly as possible, let's sit here. I wasn't going to wait any longer. Ava opened her mouth, but I didn't give her a chance to avoid getting to the heart of the matter she had dropped like a bomb on my happiness. Instead, I simply pulled her to the center of the park and tugged her down to sit next to me. Luckily, she didn't try to argue, quietly complying and sitting on the bench beside me. Her hands settled over her swollen belly, rubbing the flesh in circles in a slightly hypnotic and soothing way. Whether she was soothing the baby or herself, I didn't know. I stared down at my hands, focusing on my beautiful ring. I'd been looking at it all day, tracing the patterns with my fingers and admiring the large stone at its heart. It had caused my own heart to swell, warmth to linger in my body, and a smile to touch my lips in what I was beginning to think was a permanent fixture on my face. I was incandescently happy, and now… Spit it out, Ava. I managed to say, though my throat was tight and my heart was aching. I still looked at my ring like it was a lifeline. Like no matter what Ava said, I would figure this out. You were saying I can't marry Christian. Ava lifted her arm and whispered a spell. I couldn't see the shield wrap around us, but I had to assume she was making sure that no one else could hear our conversation. Ava was our father's oldest child, and the heir to the High Warlock and all his power. She was very good at magic overall, but would be adept at protective spells now. It was actually a brilliant move on her part, one I was surprised I hadn't thought of first. Once she was satisfied, she turned on the bench to look at me. For a moment she didn't say anything, she just looked at me. Just when I thought I couldn't stand the silence any longer, she began to speak. I didn't realize that you didn't know. I'm so sorry. I pulled my hair out of the bun I'd put it up in, tugging at the strands in frustration. I couldn't look at her eyes, couldn't stand to see the pity in her face. Ava, assume I'm totally stupid and have no idea what you're talking about. Explain it step by step. Slowly. I was going to be sick if she didn't hurry up with her explanation. Actually, I might have just left Ava there. I wasn't in the mood to play stupid games with her. Something on my face must have alerted her to that fact, because Ava waved her hand and magicked up a bottle of water. Here. Have a drink. I took it and gulped down the cool water, enjoying the way the drink immediately quenched my parched throat. Even so, this was just prolonging the inevitable, and it grated on my nerves even worse than someone cracking the spine of a book or folding pages instead of using a bookmark. After I'd swallowed it down, I waited for her to explain. But she didn't. Ava, I growled at her, sick of waiting. She rolled her eyes and groaned. Her head fell into her hand. You're not going to like it. A reason I couldn't marry the man of my dreams. Of course, I wasn't going to like it. Tell me anyway, I said, setting the bottle next to me and bunching my hands in my lap. I swear, magic was ready to burst out of me if I wasn't careful. 
if she didn't get on with it. She sighed and leaned back on the bench to rub her belly some more. The laws of the Warlock Council forbid any, uh, inter-race marriages, especially when one is a witch or warlock. If you were a dragon shifter wanting to marry a fae, they'd probably look the other way. I blinked once then twice, waiting for the punchline of the joke, but it didn't come. I put a hand up. Hang on a second. Are you telling me that the stupid freaking council, the one that tried to execute you for being our father's heir, has a rule that I can't marry Christian simply on the basis that I'm a witch and he's a werewolf? She tilted her head to the side. In short, yes. You can't marry anyone who isn't a warlock. A gasp burst out of me. What? You married Tavlor and he's half fae. Tavlor was half fae and half warlock, which made him dangerous and very powerful. Ava moved heaven and earth to be with him, even though any sort of relationship between them had been frowned upon. However, that could have been because of her status as the heir to the High Warlock and him being regarded as less than scum because of his mixed blood as well as his subordinate position as a guard. Ava bit her lip. Well, we kinda slipped through a loophole because Tavlor is half warlock, worked for the council, and was raised in the magical realm. You know a lot of the magical community think he's some sort of, savage, but they couldn't stop me from marrying him. Technically, at least. I got to my feet and brushed off my long sweater. You even got married in fairy, Ava, so don't tell me you can't see the double standard here. Ava nodded. I know, Bella. But the shifters aren't magical. Most of the witches and warlocks in this realm think of them as nothing more than animals. Ah. I growled at the idea and crossed my arms over my chest. I don't think of the shifters that way, she reassured me. Quite the opposite. Christian is a gentle, beautiful soul. I've met Faye much more savage than your shifter. Then what can I do? I demanded. I'm going to marry him, Ava. No matter what. She frowned up at me, still sitting on the park bench. You can't, Bella. You're one of the daughters of the High Warlock, his second heir. They won't allow it. And what were they going to do to stop me? Ava got to her feet this time. I know that look, Bella. Please don't. Don't what? I asked her, though I was already planning what I was going to wear. We could have a secret wedding, at our home or in the woods. I'd wear a simple white flowing dress with lace and wildflowers in my hair. Bella. Ava snapped. I glared back at her. What would you have done if someone told you that you couldn't marry Tavlor? They did tell me that, she ground out, her violet eyes flashing with remembered anger. I glared right back. And look at you now. Married and pregnant, and still the heir to the High Warlock. You beat the system, so I'm going to as well. She gripped her belly. It's not the same, Ava. I turned around to walk away but she grabbed for my arm, holding me tightly. Don't go. Okay. We'll work something out. Maybe Tavlor can help, or Dad. I twisted back around to look at her. Dad? I still find it so strange calling him that. She shrugged. I want him in my life, in my baby's life. Just because he and mother couldn't get their relationship to work, doesn't mean we should follow in their footsteps. I nodded. Yeah, I guess. I'd never really wanted a relationship with our elusive father, but Ava and Courtney had. Now that I had him in my life, I didn't mind it, but it was still strange. So what's the next step? I asked her. She pressed her lips together. Would you consider just living in sin like you have been? For how long? I asked, in full knowledge that she was going to say forever. Um, for as long as possible. I inhaled sharply. And our children. Ava gasped, then tried to cough and clear the noise. I narrowed my gaze at her. What are you gasping over now? Well, ah. Uh, I'm not sure if you can have children with Christian. Interspecies children are very uncommon and from her tone, very unwelcome as well. I pointedly stared at her belly, then flicked my gaze up to her eyes and raised an eyebrow. She had the good grace to flush red. 
It took us ages to get pregnant, and Tavlor thinks it's because he's half fae. I was considering leaving again, until Ava linked her arm in mine once more. Bella, I'm not trying to hurt you. I want you to be happy more than anything. Then help me, I urged her. I will, she said. I'll speak to Tavlor and our father. We'll work out a way. I wanted to yell, scream, and call out to the universe how unfair this was. But I held it in, and let Ava walk me back towards the shops. Can we talk to them now? I asked. Ava turned towards the blanket shop. Tavlor is in the Fey realm, and Father is in meetings until dinner time. We can go later, if you want. I nodded, fighting the tears that were now swimming in my eyes. Yes. Please. Ava squeezed my hand. Do you want to cancel shopping and just go home? I totally understand if you do. I gulped at the air, my jaw dropping and words escaping me momentarily. Part of me desperately did. I wanted to run home and burrow into Christian's arms, never to leave again. But I hadn't seen Ava in too long, and she deserved to have some time to celebrate her long-awaited baby. No. It's okay. Let's shop. Then I'll go home and tell Christian I'm spending the evening with you. She nodded, understanding clear in her eyes. Let's get a blanket, then go home. I think you need it. I nodded and managed to pull myself together long enough to oh and ah over blankets, bibs and bonnets. But inside my head, my mind was a whirl. After everything the council had done to try and destroy our lives, they were going to take away my right to choose my own husband? And a baby, was it really true that Christian and I couldn't conceive? Were we really so different? Once Ava was finished shopping, I ducked into the library on my way home and checked out some books on shifters and interspecies breeding. They had never been checked out. Ever. I tucked them into my bag and walked home to the shifter realm. The author of both books was the League of Witches. Hum, maybe it was a collective effort? I mumbled to myself as I stepped through the invisible door and into the shifter realm. I slipped the books back into my bag to read for research later and hurried up to the cottage I shared with Christian. Ava would go straight to our father, and I didn't want to miss out on the conversation. I pushed open the door, relieved to see Christian was already home. He was standing near our bed with a towel wrapped around his waist and his long hair wet and tangled. He was as sexy as sin, and my stomach clenched with longing just looking at him. Hey Bella. I wasn't expecting you home just yet. I thought you'd spend most of the night with your sister. I swallowed hard and shut the door behind me. Yeah, I'm meeting up with her in a bit, but I just needed to talk to you first. He ran a hand through his long hair, making his abdominals flex and the muscles in his chest and arms ripple. Oh yeah? Everything okay? I shook my head. No. No it's not. Ava told me that we aren't allowed to get married that it's illegal. I was still fuming at the very idea of it. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Christian walked over and slid his arms around my waist, holding me close. Is that what's upset you so much? It's a simple fix. We just do a wolf mating ceremony and not worry about the legal warlock crap. It's not relevant in our world anyway. My jaw dropped. You knew. Did he know that I couldn't have his baby too? Chapter 3 Bella Christian shrugged in a way that made me want to wallop him. How could he have left that particular part out? It seemed rather important, and something he might have discussed with his witch girlfriend before proposing. Yeah. Sort of. Like he was talking about the chance of rain. I pushed out of his arms and forced myself to walk away so I didn't lash out at him, even though he rightly deserved it. I needed a moment to gather my thoughts, to control the rising temper threatening to bubble over, what do you mean, sort of. Christian walked over to our closet, grabbed a gray t-shirt and tugged it on over his two ripped torso. I wanted to refrain from looking at him, because he didn't deserve my lingering gaze. However, even through my anger, I wasn't immune to the way his body flexed and moved as he put on the shirt. 
He was infuriating, but even I couldn't deny he was gorgeous as well. Damn him. I mean, I assumed that the council wouldn't want us to get married but why should we care? He asked, glancing over his shoulder at me. We can do a bonding ceremony under shifter law. The council doesn't need to know. How did he not understand how important it was that everyone recognize our relationship? Did he even care about what I wanted? And what did that mean anyway? A bonding ceremony? So, would I have to live with him in a pack? Could I still practice magic? What were the rules? What was the structure? He couldn't just tell me this like it was a viable option without explaining every minute detail. Christian continued, plus your dad supports us. He built us this place and created a safe space for my pack to thrive. What more do we want? I inhaled deeply and asked the last question for which I wanted an answer. Is it true that we can't have a baby? I asked slowly. A baby, he repeated, his eyes going wide like I had shot him with some kind of spell and he hadn't been prepared for it. I hadn't really thought about. Christian was only a few years older than me, so at 24, he probably hadn't thought much about it. He was also a man who didn't think he'd be proposing either. I understood that. I did. But to me, it was important. Not that I'd ever thought I'd have a husband, let alone a family. But being surrounded by the pack made me think about my future, and I wanted what they had. I wanted my own family. I wanted the freedom and ability to do that. To create life with the man I loved. Ava said that we won't be able to, I said, bitterness clear in my voice. That because we're different species, we just won't. Mesh. Our genes won't align or something like that. Which also meant that all the safety precautions we'd been taking to prevent pregnancy could be thrown out the window. Not that it was relevant now, especially since I still didn't know if it was true. Oh. I didn't know, Christian said quietly, slipping on some jeans then walking over to wrap me up in his big arms again. He seemed a tad more sympathetic. Then again, I knew wolves were notorious for hiding their true feelings. Maybe he was affected and just not showing it. Maybe he was being strong for me. Still, I wanted some kind of reaction that would show me he cared. I laid my head on his chest and took long steady breaths. I didn't want to cry. Not today. Christian had proposed to me this morning. That should have been enough to make my whole month happy, but here I was, on the verge of a sobbing session because my stupid magical blood wanted to screw everything up. I didn't want to believe Ava. I wanted to reserve judgment but the truth was, it was logical. We were from different species. There was no guarantee we'd have the ability to procreate. And the fact that I assumed we could just showed me how naive I truly was. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I really didn't know. He rubbed my back in soothing circles, just the way he knew I liked. I closed my eyes and inhaled deeply. Just the scent of him was enough to calm my racing heart, and even though I was still sad, somehow, Christian had this way of making everything better, and he didn't even have to try all that hard. After another lingering moment, I pulled back and wiped at my face where a few stupid tears had escaped. It's okay. And you know, she might be wrong. I'll find out more tonight. I'm going to speak to Tavlor and my father. Do you want me to go with you? He asked, touching my chin and encouraging me to look up and meet his gaze. His eyes were warm, supportive. And he did care. His tone might not reveal it, but when he looked at me, I knew he did. I shook my head. No. I think I should deal with them on my own. Because I didn't anticipate the conversation I was going to have would be pleasant, and the last thing I wanted was to be in the middle of something. Again. Okay. Well, I'm here if you need me. I went up on my toes and kissed him, stoking the fire of desire that always simmered between us. How he was able to do that, I didn't understand. Passion was never a word I associated with myself until now. Until Christian and I hoped that never changed. I've gotta go, I whispered, pushing out of his arms but wishing I could stay. 
I sighed, curling stray hair behind my ear. If anyone knows how to get the council to bend to her will, it's Ava. He chuckled. Oh yeah. She's a formidable force. Christian had only met Ava a handful of times, but he went basically mute when he did. She was a force to behold when she went going. Just like our mother had been. The fact that she had the ability to render a werewolf speechless was one of the many powers she possessed. I closed my eyes and used my magic to get changed, wanting to wear something clean and new. I created a royal purple floor-length dress with a black belt and light cardigan. Wow. You look gorgeous, Bella. I adjusted the glasses on my nose and smiled at him. Thanks. I kissed him once more, careful not to let it develop into anything else before pulling away. I won't be long. Hopefully. He grinned at me as he leaned against the kitchen counter. See you soon, beautiful. Good luck. I stepped outside and hurried back along the path, stepping through the shifter realm door, then using magic to take me the rest of the way. With a snap of my fingers, I was magicked to the steps of the council building. I hurried up the stairs and inside. I had to smile, swipe and step through multiple doors, but once I was at the fifth step, I was walking through to the High Warlock's inner sanctum. Courtney was sitting on the couch, flicking through a magazine like she was any other teenager, bored and out of place. Court. Her head came up, making her orange curls bounce around her face. Bella. What are you doing here? She jumped to her feet and came over to hug me. I clung tightly to my sister, relishing in the comfort she brought with her. We were so different, but I loved Courtney like no other. When I pulled back, she was frowning at me. You okay? I sighed. Kind of. I need to talk to Dad. Ava said she'd be here too. Court grinned. You mean the waddling prego? She laughed this time. She wanted a shower, and I think she's still in there. Dad's not due back for? She glanced at the wall where a clock ticked away. Oh. He'll only be a few minutes, probably. The door to Ava's old bedroom opened and our older sister came out, ripping her huge belly. I swear I get more pregnant every minute. Well, technically, Court grinned at Ava, you do. Ava glared at our younger sister, then waddled to the couch and collapsed down onto the cushions. Shut up. Not long now, I said, sitting also but on a chair further away. How'd you do talking to Christian? Ava asked me. I shrugged, much like he had. He wasn't as shocked as I was. Shocked about what? Courtney asked, waving her hand over the coffee table and magicking up some sandwiches and a platter of fruit. I hadn't really eaten much today, so I grabbed for a piece of watermelon, crunching down on the sweet fruit. This, I managed to say between mouthfuls, holding up my left hand to display my new engagement ring. Courtney bounced across the room perched on my seat arm and grabbed my hand. Oh my god! Christian proposed. It's about time. It's obvious he's totally besotted, and so are you. I glanced across at Ava, whose lips turned down on each side. But before I could say anything else, the door opened once more and our father walked in, with Tavlor closely behind him. Oh, what a wonderful surprise, Dad said, walking over to greet me all three of my daughters in the same room. It's been too long. I agreed, it had been. I only wished it was under happier circumstances. Tavlor nodded his head at me, then headed over to Ava. They kissed and hugged, and he rubbed her belly in a possessive way that had my heart aching for things I'd never thought I wanted before now. Is this an impromptu visit? Dad asked, taking off his cloak. Or is there something I can help you with, Bella? I took a deep breath, deciding it was easier to just to jump into the conversation. No pussyfooting around. Well, Dad. This morning, Christian asked me to marry him. I lifted my hand to display my gorgeous ring. But when I spoke to Ava about it, she said I wasn't allowed to marry him, so I'm here to talk to you about it. My father, who was the very picture of elegance from his black suit to his coiffed hair, gaped at me. His jaw dropped and his eyes widened. Then just as quickly, his jaw snapped shut, and he rushed forward with his arms open wide. 
Congratulations. What wonderful news. I let him hug me, squeezing him back, knowing that my joy would be short-lived. And that kind of ruined the whole affect. When dad pulled back, he conjured up a tray with five glasses of champagne. A toast, he announced, lifting the tray for all of us to take a glass. Ava waved her hand over hers, turning the bubbles into a red juice of some sort. Still no alcohol, dad. He laughed. I forgot. Sorry. I took a glass, my hand trembling with anxiety. I tried to push the feelings back, channeling my original happiness from this morning. To Bella, Dad said, lifting his glass. To your happiness, Ava said. Always. We clinked our glass and took a drink. My sip was small, my stomach churning too wildly to enjoy the moment. Ava sat down, as she always seemed to need to do in her condition, and the rest of us followed. Courtney curled up on the armchair next to me, Tavlor sat with Ava on the couch, and our father took a seat on the second couch. So. I said, throwing my agitation into the room. Is Ava correct? Is it illegal for me to marry Christian? Dad slid to the edge of his couch and leaned forward. The council has laws about shifters and witches not legally marrying. I heard the emphasis on legal, and it set my teeth on edge. So, you feel the same as Christian? That we should do a bonding ceremony of some sort instead. My father didn't look surprised by that information, which made me suspicious. He came and asked you, didn't he? My father smiled softly. Yes. He did. Oh my God. The wolf shifter came and asked my father for permission to marry me. I slouched back in my chair. I can't believe it. Neither of you even care that our union won't be legal. Or sanctioned. We'll be the outcasts. The bastards. And I'd had enough of being a bastard, thank you very much. My father cleared his throat as though he'd heard my internal thought. Bella, Christian believed that his Pax mating ceremony was enough. He'd never really thought of getting married in warlock terms. He's a shifter. They're different, and that's a good thing. I glared at him. That isn't comforting. Courtney cackled out a laugh. Bella, you never even wanted to leave our realm. Now you've found an awesome guy who loves you and you love him. Who cares if the stupid council wants you to be married or not? Do what you want. I stared at my father. What would happen if I pushed to get married in this realm as a witch to a shifter? My father stilled and I knew that look. He was worried. I don't think that would be a good idea, Bella, he said, and the tightness in his voice gave me pause. Can't you just smooth over that rule? Courtney asked, piping up again. You or Ava? Just rewrite the law or something. Surely you can do that. When Ava and our father just stared at each other, my anger began to simmer and burn. Why don't the shifters have equal rights to the warlocks? Why are they considered an inferior species? I don't know, Ava responded. It's totally wrong and something I want to change. But those changes take time, my father said. We've already rocked so many boats, and although I'm proud of the changes we've effected since you three stepped into my life. Yeah. What's the problem? I demanded, putting down my champagne glass before I broke the fragile stem. You're more important than any law or code, my father said, his tone insistent. And there have already been multiple attempts on your lives. I just want you safe. I nodded understanding where he was coming from, and yet it didn't sit well with me. Ava had ended up on the assassin's list for simply being our father's heir. Courtney was poisoned for the same reason, and I'd been attacked in the library as well. Thank you for explaining, I managed to say, though there was no way that was the end of things. I ushered the topic of conversation to Ava's baby and Tavlor's travels, but in the back of my mind, I was formulating a plan. If my father, with all his power and influence, couldn't affect the change that was needed in this realm, then maybe it was time for me to step up in my role and become the daughter of the high warlock I'd been born to be. Chapter 4 Bella I stayed at my father's apartment for a few hours, but I was dying to go home. 
I needed to see Christian, but more than that, I needed space. I needed to take in what I had been told, and let it sink in. I needed time to sort out what made sense and what questions I still had. And maybe, I needed a distraction in the shape of a wolf. I managed to say goodbye and leave without an escort, which was amazing. Ever since the attack at the library, I went nowhere without a guard, especially at night. But instead of walking the streets, I magicked myself to the wolf shifter realm entrance then ran inside. I wasn't sure if I preferred the guard or not, but I liked the sense of freedom I had now that I could magic my way over here. I didn't like the running part, but I wasn't much for running in the first place. It had been a stroke of genius from my father to protect this part of the magical realm, impenetrable by anyone except the wolf shifters and me. I shook my head as I walked towards our cottage, trying to catch my breath while not sounding like a wheezing buzzard. Thoughts from earlier began to penetrate my mind now that I knew I was safe. Maybe I was being unfair or unreasonable to expect to have the same rights as everyone else. Maybe being with Christian like this was a dream I didn't have a right to have. But everything about this situation spoke of bigotry and discrimination. It didn't seem fair. If we both wanted to be with each other, if our relationship was built on love and trust and respect just like everyone else's relationship, why was ours condemned? Christian's mind was rational as was mine. He emoted his feelings. He worked a job, made money, paid his taxes, provided, just like every other man. And yet, he didn't have the right to marry whom he loved. It wasn't fair. And me. I balled my hands into tight fists. I could respect tradition and culture, but this. This felt as though someone had placed unnecessary control over people who loved each other. So, the magic realm could trade resources with the wolves, we could potentially rely on them for protection, but they weren't good enough to marry. Who decided that and why? My head pinched. I was starting to get a headache. The town was quiet and the streets were empty. The wolf shifters went to bed with the sun and got up with it too. It was their way. Did they care they couldn't marry a witch or a warlock? I only saw it from the perspective of a witch, from a community that was known to uphold prejudicial traditions and laws, but did the wolves feel the same way? I pushed open the door and found Christian had already gone to bed. His soft snores filled the room, and all the lights were off except for the lamp on my side of the bed. I glanced at the clock on the wall, shocked to see it was hours later than I'd expected. Damn. Guilt grew in my stomach. He must have been worried about me. I should have let him know I would be running late though, to be fair, I hadn't realized how much time had passed. I'd forgotten how easily I lost track of everything in my father's private realm. Time seemed to pass differently there. I tiptoed over to my side of the bed, magicked away my clothes and slid beneath the cool covers. Shivering, I shuffled forward, pressing against my fiancé's naked back. Christian's body was a furnace where I warmed myself, chasing away the shudders that racked my body. Though whether the shudders stemmed from the cold or my frustration, I didn't know. Hum. Hi, he moaned, still half asleep. Did everything go okay? I pressed my lips to his back. Yeah. Everything's okay. Go back to sleep. You're late, he pointed out, stifling a yawn. I was worried. I'm sorry, I said, and I meant it. I didn't mean to worry you. But I'm here, and I'm okay. You can go back to sleep. He immediately returned to snoring softly, and I nestled into him and didn't move, thankful I didn't have to tell him everything I had learned just yet. Unfortunately, I couldn't sleep. Instead, my mind cycled through memories some of my childhood. Magic lessons and my mother's strict parenting. She'd kept us safe from the wrath of the council, but she'd also made sure we didn't know a thing about the outside world, which left us ignorant and vulnerable. I'd thought I'd be happy for the rest of my life, alone. Solitary. Having no one to count on, and no one to count on me. I could tend my garden and take care of my sisters. But here I lay, listening to the steady thump of my wolf shifter's heartbeat, and I couldn't imagine being alone again. 
I also couldn't imagine being with anyone other than Christian. I loved him more than I'd ever thought possible. So, could I be happy having our union seen as nothing more than an illegal marriage? Would I be satisfied to never have a child of my own? Should I be grateful I got to have him like this, even though I wanted more? My memories flicked back to the day I'd left my mother's magical realm forever. Courtney had been poisoned and was dying. I'd gone to my mother's oldest friend, Aunt Allison, and she'd given me the help I'd needed to save Courtney. She'd also said, you won't be alone with your books for long. Don't be sad, and don't be afraid. Just leap into this new world and follow your heart. You won't go wrong. Was this the future she'd seen for me? And if Christian and I couldn't have children, would he be happy with that? Would I? Could the pack be enough? I'd have nieces and nephews, more than likely. Could they fill our lives and our hearts enough, so that we'd never miss the children we couldn't have? Sadness swamped me, but I closed my eyes and pushed the feeling away with all my strength. Christian loved me. That had to be enough. For now. The next morning, I was up early, having slept on and off all night. Christian grabbed a quick bite and headed off for the day. Houses to build. People to save, he said with a grin as he kissed me goodbye. I waved him off and curled up in my barrel chair in the corner with the books I'd checked out of the library yesterday. I still had an hour before I had to be at work and wanted to see what the League of Witches had written about. Trying to convince myself through the night that Christian was enough hadn't really worked because our inability to marry was only a symptom of a much larger problem. The inequality in the way the different races were treated within the magical realm was shocking. The witches and warlocks lorded their magic over everyone else. Mixed breeds like Tavlor would be considered savages or worse. The Fey were looked down on, but were higher on the hierarchy than shifters because they were ancient magical beings. The shifters were the lowest of the low. Animals. Some of the council believed that all shifters should be exterminated. Others wanted them as slaves. For me, the shifters were people. Big-hearted, loving, loyal, wonderful people. And the idea that anyone else would treat them badly made me so freaking angry. I flicked through the first book and found it to be a lot heavier on the science than I'd expected. Information on genetic codes and such. But in the end, they said something wonderful. That all of us, the witches, shifters and fey, all had a common ancestor on our human side. So breeding between all the different factions was possible. More than possible. I covered my mouth with my hand. I'd never read anything so wonderful. When I looked up at the clock, I jumped to my feet. Shit. Going to be late again. I tucked the book into my nightstand pile and ran to work, my heart happy and my happiness level on an ultimate high. If Christian was content to have a bonding mating ceremony, why shouldn't I be happy as well? We lived together, loved each other, and had the full support of both our families. Not to mention the fact that I'd just learned that we could have a baby. Not that I was in a hurry, but knowing the option was there made everything else so much easier to deal with. I was being ridiculous, wanting more. The day passed quickly, and I even told Hillary about our engagement. Oh, Bella. I'm so happy for you. Thanks, I gushed and enjoyed the boost to my already saturated happiness level. Late in the afternoon, I was in the encyclopedia section, and there was a book out of place. I pulled the thin, leather-bound book down from the shelf and stared at it. The front cover didn't have a title, only a strange star with a moon and a magical flourish, all in gold embossment. I opened the front page, and there were the words that had been hanging around me the last few days. The League of Witches but who were they? I didn't really believe in signs. That wasn't a part of magic that could be quantified. But my mother had been a big believer in following your gut instincts, and everything inside of me was telling me I needed to track these authors down. I took the book to the front desk and checked it out. Once again, there had never been another borrow date. Ever. Curiosa and Curiosa. 
I was doing the late shift today, so I stayed on to close, turn off all the lights and lock up. Tavlor, my brother-in-law, walked in the door just as I was picking up my bag to go home. Hi Bella. Tavlor, I greeted him warmly, pleasantly surprised to see him. I wasn't expecting you. Do you need something from the library, or is it me you're here for? He inclined his head and held his hands behind his back, much like a royal guard would. The high warlock asked me to escort you home. I narrowed my eyes at him. Something was off. Really? His smile was adorable. Tavlor was not traditionally handsome, but he had an aura of strength that made him more attractive than any warlock I'd ever met. Probably because he's half fey. No. Actually, I wanted to speak to you. May I walk you home? I chuckled, enjoying his candor. Of course. Give me just one minute. I snuck my new book into my bag, grabbed the keys and locked up as we left. Once outside I pulled on my sweater, the temperature much cooler than when I'd left home this morning. I wanted to officially congratulate you on your engagement, he said, his words and language more formal than I was used to. Thank you. And I wanted to tell you that I admire you for loving someone who is outside the norm for so many other witches. I gave him a sidelong glance. You know we aren't traditional witches. We didn't grow up with your screwed up view of society. He smiled at me this time. I know but I still think it's worth saying. You're an impressive woman, Bella. There was a meaning behind his words that I was missing, and he wasn't saying. We continued to walk along the street, and my instincts kicked up. I wasn't sure if I was going to regret asking the question, but everything inside of me was pushing at me to ask anyway. Hey Tavlor, I said, my stomach twisting at the prospect of the answer. Yes? Have you heard of the League of Witches? His silence was deafening. We continued to amble along the road towards the shifter realm, and yet there was an awkward stiffness to Tavlor that I couldn't quite pinpoint. He cleared his throat. Where did you hear that phrase? They seem to be the authors of some books in the library, I said, choosing not to pull the book out of my bag and prove it to him. I found three of them so far. He wasn't saying anything, but he knew something. Is it a group? I persisted. Or is one author using a strange pseudonym? He stayed silent, walking steadily along next to me. I stopped at the realm door and indicated the invisible shield. Sorry. You can't come in unless the Alpha lets you. It's programmed that way. He nodded. I understand. A very clever piece of magic by the High Warlock. Tavlor's high cheekbones were slashed with color, and I had to assume it was something other than the cool night making him glow. What is it, Tavlor? What aren't you telling me? He glanced along the road as though to ascertain if anyone listened to us, but there was no one to be seen. The authors you refer to are a group of witches. Rebels. Magicals who do not like the council, nor the rules by which we all are required to live. Sounded like my sort of people. So, it's a current group? Tavlor's forehead wrinkled up. I am not sure. It's been years since I've heard the name spoken. I nodded and sighed. Okay. Well thank you for the walk home, but I better go in. I missed out on dinner with Christian last night, and I'd like to see him tonight. Shifters go to bed early. Tavlor stepped back and inclined his head once more. Be careful, Bella. Okay. The council's feathers are easily ruffled, and I know we've done a reasonable job of keeping them at bay so far. I guffawed at him. Seriously? They sent an assassin to kill Courtney and me, then whipped Christian in the town square in front of the whole pack. Tavlor's gaze was serious. It could be a lot worse, Bella. So please just be careful. I nodded at him solemnly. I will. Night. Then I turned and slipped through the entrance to the pack, my mind a whirl. What was Tavlor warning me about? And did it have anything to do with the League of Witches? Chapter 5 Bella When I arrived home, 
Christian was showered and dressed in clean clothes, standing in front of the fridge. Hey, beautiful. What do you want for dinner? I sat down at the table and lifted my hand. I know you prefer to cook, but I'm in the mood for pizza. Do you mind if I magic some up? He grinned at me and came over to sit at the small wooden table with four chairs. Sure. Why not? His stomach rumbled and he placed a hand over it. I'd eat just about anything right now. What do you like? I asked. I didn't really have a hankering for pizza, but I wanted to talk to him and perhaps go to bed early. So, cutting out cooking and cleaning up time would be helpful, and it might soften him up to open up to me about some things I needed clarification on. Oh, a little bit of everything, he said with a grin. I wanted to roll my eyes and point out how incredibly unhelpful that was, but his damn charming smile won me over every time, no matter how much I tried to fight against it. Instead, I bit back the grin and focused on the task at hand. I waved my hand and conjured up three pizzas with varying toppings. Supreme, barbecue chicken and a margarita. He could choose what he wanted from there, so I didn't have to play his guessing game. He inhaled deeply and moaned. Oh my god that's so good. He winked at me. You're very talented with your hands, you know. I blushed despite myself. So I've been told. By me, he insisted. Only by me. I said nothing and gave him a teasing wink in return. He grabbed for a slice and I snapped my fingers to add some drinks. Coke for him and a raspberry lemonade for me. The ice tinkled as I picked up the glass and took a long sip. He laughed this time. Is there a special occasion? I set the glass down carefully on the table. You mean other than our engagement? And how much I love you? Not really. He finished his slice and went on to another. What's up, Bella? I know that look. You've got something on your mind. You might as well come out and say it. I reached for my bag and pulled out the leather book. It was thin to have such an elegant design. I carefully set it between us so he could see it, but not risk getting pizza grease on the cover. I keep finding these books, I said. I checked out two yesterday and this one today, and I don't know what their significance is. Christian shrugged and grabbed for his glass of Coke. Finding an interesting book isn't new for you, he pointed out. I know, but the authors of all three of the books are the League of Witches, I said before realizing I was talking to a wolf. Have you heard of them? His dark eyes narrowed. Is that the group of witches who made a big hullabaloo a few years ago about shifters' rights but ended up having half of us thrown out of the magical realm? He asked, his voice gruffer than I expected from him. My chest tightened. Ah. Uh, I don't know. You know I don't have much history with these realms. It could be, but I'm not 100% sure and you know me. I don't like to assume anything. He sighed and set his pizza down. For a moment, he did nothing but stare at it. I pressed my lips together to keep myself from saying something. I knew what that look of consternation was, he was thinking of what to say and how to say it. As much as I wanted to push him for some idea about what was going on in his head, I wasn't going to rush him. This was too important. If it's the same group, you need to stay away from them, he said slowly. You know I don't like telling you what you can and can't do, and I don't, I'm not trying to do that now. But they're in a different league, Bella. I know they probably had their hearts in the right place, but it was hell for us who went through the ordeal they created. We're still recovering from it. I chewed on my bottom lip, knowing I should probably leave the subject alone, but unable to. A dog with a bone and all that. Though in my case, it was more like a book. Okay, so you've heard of them. But they're troublemakers? I asked, testing the waters, trying to probe for more information without pushing him away. I teetered a thin line, I knew, but I also knew this was important. No. Not exactly. Christian dragged his hand through his hair, staring down at his pizza as though he was purposefully avoiding looking at the book. More like, people who tried to do a good thing, but fucked everything up instead. He glanced sharply at me. Why? 
You're not thinking about looking for them, are you? I very quickly shook my head. Oh no. I was just wondering if they were a group of authors, a pen name or something else. Of course, I was going to find them. They wanted to change the trajectory of the shifters and the phi. They may have disbanded or be unwilling to help me, but if there was anyone who'd support my desire to find an equal footing for my family, it would be them. He reached over the table and squeezed my hand. As long as I have you and the pack is safe, nothing else matters to me, he said. I know the whole marriage and children thing is something we didn't want to hear, but if I can have you for the rest of my life, Bella, I'd be happy with that. I don't need anything else. My heart clenched. As much as I wished I could feel the same way, I couldn't. I wanted it all with Christian, because that was what we deserved. We deserved to be recognized as a married couple. We deserved to have the same rights as everyone else. We deserved to have the ability to procreate if we wanted to, and I did want to. If I could change that, if I could do something about it, I would. Christian's eyes were on me, and I realized I had been silent for too long. I picked up my first piece of margarita pizza and forced myself to grin at him. I did learn one fantastic thing today. Not that I'm in any rush, but I read that it's possible for us to have children. His smile was huge as he stared at me, flashing all his brilliant white teeth. Can't wait to have my baby, huh? My cheeks heated with a blush, but I didn't look away. Well, I think we'd be good parents. Someday. And I hated the idea that the choice was taken away from us. Ava had said it was quite difficult for her to conceive, so perhaps it wouldn't be easy for us, but I wouldn't give up hope. I would have tried anyway, Christian said with a smile. After all, you're my mate, my woman. I knew the moment I laid eyes on you that we were meant to be. Did you now? I asked, chuckled at the way he waggled his eyebrows at me. Of course, he said. And that means babies. Family. Love. All of it. Sounds amazing, I said and finally started eating properly. We went to bed and loved on each other in a way that I'd only thought was possible in books and movies. The next day, I wasn't working, so I'd kissed Christian goodbye and sent him off with a huge basket of blueberry muffins I'd magically whipped up. Don't tell them, I'd said, and he laughed as he walked off to the area where all the new construction was going on. My father could have built them all new houses, but the pack wanted to manage the construction, and they were a proud bunch. As soon as he was gone, I took a shower, got dressed in comfy warm clothes, and curled up in my reading chair with my books. The first book was all about bloodlines and how we all came from humans originally. Even the phi, which was why the very idea of genetic supremacy was complete hogwash. It also meant I could have Christian's baby, so that was all good. The second book was philosophy. About why it wasn't right to have a hierarchy where the magicals treated those weaker than them like slaves. It was a good read overall, though a little intense in parts. By then it was lunchtime. I made myself a pot of tea, a light chicken salad, and settled into my chair with the third book. This one had the most incredible pages, filled with silver highlighting and beautiful pictures. The text, however, was encrypted or in a language I simply didn't understand, because I definitely couldn't read it. I wonder if Dad would know what it is, I mumbled to myself as I finished my lunch. The book was important though, I could tell. I needed to find this League of Witches, and I knew who would help. Courtney. My baby sister's middle name was Rebel. Not literally, of course, but she loved getting into trouble. She always had. I finished lunch, packed my bag with a leather book hidden in the secret compartment and headed out. Hey Lucy. Nice to see you. I waved at some of the shifters as I walked towards the veil. She waved back and her little girl who'd been clutching her mother's skirt smiled at me. Some of the pack were still a little weary of me, and that was understandable. I was the high warlock's heir and a pure-blooded witch. The epitome of what they'd learned to fear. And yet I wasn't. And in time hopefully they'd all know that. I headed straight to the council's buildings and walked up the first receptionist. 
Her name tag said her name was Nicole, and her long blonde hair was arranged on top of her hair. Hello Bella, she greeted me, her back ramrod stiff. Are you here for an appointment? I shook my head. I hated how they asked that every time. They knew that 99% of the time, I just wanted access to my father's private realm, and that required jumping through four portals to get there. No. I was going to ask Courtney to go out for lunch. Do you know if she... Nicole practically shuddered at the idea. Oh, I wouldn't know anything about the High Warlock's personal affairs. I sighed. We didn't have an easy way to communicate at the moment. Because of the security around Dad's realm, and the fact that Courtney was either there or in the Adunnel Fee family realm, calling her on the phone just wasn't an option. I sighed. Fine. Buzz me through and I'll jump through all the doors to see her. Nicole inclined her head and magicked up the first of the traveling portals. I gripped my bag and moved through the first of the strange cold jumping ponds. The next room had a large male security guard. It was the same drill, until I was finally opening the door to my father's apartment. Oh thank God you're here. I practically groaned at Courtney, who jumped up from couch where she'd been reading. What do you mean, she asked. What's wrong? Nothing, I said, hugging her to me. I just hate having to move through four freaking portals just to see you. I wish we had an easier way to communicate. Courtney laughed. Yeah, me too. I get so bored here alone. There was an undercurrent that I didn't miss. She was lonely, but she'd never say it. Maybe you should come live in the pack realm, I said off the cuff. Dad could whip you up a little apartment near our cottage. It's quiet but you'd like the people I'm sure. She sat down on the couch where she'd been when I walked in. That would be great, but ah. Uh, I need to stay here for a little while longer. I'm still having some strange outbursts and my energy isn't great. I sat down on the chair closest to her, my heart tugging at her words. Courtney wasn't one to reveal a weakness if she could help it. So, if she was telling me she wasn't doing so well, then she wasn't. I decided to change the subject, because the most powerful witches and warlocks in this world were already working on court's problems. I could do something else. I could distract her. I pulled the leather book out of my bag and passed it to her. Can you take a look at this and tell me if you recognize the language? I can't read any of it, not even a word. Courtney rolled her eyes at me. Seriously? If you don't know what it is, I won't. I almost smacked her. Just look, please. Courtney groaned and opened the front cover. But instead of throwing it back at me like I'd expected, she stared at the pages with her eyes narrowed. Do you recognize it? I asked. Um, sort of. Yeah, she said. Really? I asked, jumping over to her couch to sit next to her. How? Well, I still go to the Adunolfi family realm, as you know. Yeah, I do. Courtney was still receiving treatments for her poisoning. You've seen this lettering there. When? How? She nodded. Yeah, I have. I'm sure I've seen books like this in our grandparents' library. Not that I was supposed to do any reading while I was there, but you know me, I'm a snoop. My jaw dropped as a piece of the puzzle fell directly into my lap. Our grandparents? The League of Witches? The Council? It was all linked. Chapter 6 Bella Courtney stared at me like I'd gone insane. And honestly, I couldn't blame her. Are you? Like, going to hyperventilate or something? I shook my head. No. I just, can I tell you what I've found so far? I asked. I needed to get this off my chest. I needed to share this with someone who might actually listen. Before she could respond one way or the other, I rattled off a summary of what I'd learned in the books. About babies and genetics, power, and the obvious discrimination that the warlocks were holding over the other races. Courtney nodded along and made disgusted noises in appropriate places to let me know she was listening. By the time I finished, I was out of breath 
and enraged all over again to the point where I could hardly stand up. I wanted to throw something. I wanted to smash something into little bits, and even then, I didn't think I'd be satisfied. They're ridiculous, she said at the end. How hard would it be to just let everyone live their lives and give everyone the same rights? How would that hurt them? Her tone was genuinely confused, like she didn't understand the thought process behind everything. And I felt the same way. I chewed on my bottom lip. That's the question, I suppose. Why do they do it, and what do they get out of it? Other than power, ego, and status, of course. I paused. More than that, is there a way to change it? Courtney grinned at me. You just listed all the reasons for conquering any type of people, land, or country, she pointed out, sticking up her index finger. Though money and greed are usually on the top of that list, because explorers wanted to find new trade routes that allowed them to travel to new lands with the intent of possibly mining the people or place for resources. And if that didn't work, taking what they could and setting up a route that would profit them. I sighed and began rearranging my hair to pull it up into a ponytail, then changed my mind and twisted it into a bun on top of my head, my thoughts whirling. Was oppressing other supernatural species akin to historical trading routes? Had the warlock community mined the shifters for natural resources, then sent the shifters away, leaving them poor and barely able to make it on their own? That's true, I finally admitted. But I don't think money is a factor here. At least not from what I can see. I mean, the shifters are in their own realm. As far as I know, the warlocks and witches don't even have to see them or interact with them if they don't want to. I don't understand how they could profit from a community that's already in poverty. Not with witches and warlocks that could make gold out of thin air. There was a cost to such magic, but it was all possible. There had to be something else going on. So, what are you going to do? Courtney asked, tucking her legs under her and sitting curled up in the corner of the couch. That was another good question. Well, I want to find them, I explained. My words were tentative, as though I didn't quite trust my own voice. My gaze dropped to my lap. The last thing I wanted was for my sister to tell me what I wanted was impossible or that I shouldn't even try. Tavlor said it was too dangerous and I shouldn't. And Christian doesn't want me to, of course. He said that the League of Witches got the shifters in trouble years ago. They were trying to do the right thing but ended up making things worse. I tugged my bottom lip between my teeth. Still, I don't think I can do nothing. Not when something so terribly unfair is taking place, and there might be something I can do about it. Why doesn't it surprise me that the League of Witches made things worse? Courtney muttered, shaking her head. Such things often happened when people attempted to stand up to an oppressor. The stakes were high. So, if you lost, things could go very bad, and typically they did. Courtney sat up straighter. You're going to find the rebels, she asked quietly, like someone might listen in on our conversation. Well, yes. I think they're important, at least to speak to. Maybe if they listen to me. Courtney narrowed her eyes at me. But why? You're not one to stir the pot like me or Ava. What's gotta be in your bonnet? Why are you willing to risk everything just for this? an old-fashioned expression I never really understood that seemed terribly out of place coming from my youngest sister. Despite what Christian and our father think, I don't think it's fair that I can't legally marry Christian. And to be honest, if the council hates our relationship that much, you know they'll find a way to destroy us anyway. Legal union or not, I said. I mean, I don't understand. I'm not even living in the magical realm. Sure I might work there or go there to visit from time to time, but my primary residence is with Christian and his pack. I just, I don't think it's fair that they can regulate something as intimate as marriage from an entire realm away. Courtney hummed in agreement. I can see what you're saying, but I'm not sure these witches are the key, she said. I shrugged and got to my feet, flattening any wrinkles that might have accumulated during our discussion. Don't care. They're the only lead I have. I need to see what they say and what they might be able to do, if anything. 
Then I turned around and raised an eyebrow at her. Wanna come find them with me? She hopped to her feet in a single bounce, giving me a lopsided grin. Of course. I haven't been in trouble for far too long. I'm overdue for some mischief. I laughed and grabbed the book, tucking it back into my bag. Do you know a better way out of here, or do we have to jump through all those freaking puddles again? I asked, not looking forward to doing just that if it could be helped. Courtney laughed and grabbed her funky magenta bag, then slung it over her shoulder. Of course I do. But I think we need to go visit our cousin, Clarissa, first. Or the grandparents. Whichever you think is best. Courtney whipped a gold card out of her bag, took it over to the door and waved the card over the wooden panel. The door glowed orange, then darkened to the brown of the wood once more. You have direct access to our familial realm. I asked, surprised. My father's family all lived in a single private realm. And although I'd been there once, I hadn't been back since. Yeah, Courtney answered with a grin. I made dad give me one. I shouldn't have to wait for him to let me in to our family realm. Duh. I sniggered, then quickly smothered it. Courtney was the youngest child, and definitely the most spoiled in nature. She opened the door, and the glimmering silver pond faced us once more. Let's go, Courtney said with a grin and dove straight through the portal. I took an extra moment to sigh and eye off the cold puddle. I really didn't like these damn things. But instead of lamenting the need for this sort of travel, I held my breath and pushed through. The silence in the middle was the only part one kinda liked, but then I was bursting through the final stage of travel and falling out the other side. Took you long enough, Courtney said, standing by the little picket fence that led into the Adenolfi garden path. I shuddered. Hate those portals. She cackled out a laugh. Really? I like them. So where to first? Clarissa or the grandparents? I considered the options. Which one do you think will know more about this language? I tapped my bag where the book was for emphasis. Courtney opened the gate and walked through, beckoning to me. I think the question is more, who's not gonna get you in trouble for having that book? It was in the library, I defended. There for public use. Any student could have found it. But not just any student found it, Courtney said, poking me in the arm. You did. We wandered along the picturesque town, individual houses branching off the central stone path. I stopped in front of small cottage I'd visited once before. I think Clarissa might be the best option. Courtney waggled her orangey red eyebrows at me. Good choice. We strolled up to the front door and knocked. Nervous butterflies fluttered inside my belly, and I clamped down on the feeling. When the door swung open, our cousin was smiling at us. Clarissa looked so much like me, so much more than Courtney ever had. She had long dark hair and glasses just like mine. Bella. Courtney. This is a surprise. Come on in. She waved us into her little home and we followed, shutting the door behind us. How have you been, Bella? I haven't seen you in ages. Clarissa walked into country-style kitchen and began making drinks. I know. It's been too long, I agreed. Clarissa's gaze flicked up to Courtney, and concern passed over her face. How have you been since our last session? Better, Courtney answered, not giving anything away. Clarissa focused back on me. To what do I owe the honor of this visit? I chuckled. I was hoping you could help me with a problem I'm having. With what? A book, actually. Clarissa laughed. A librarian is asking me for help with a book. This I've gotta see. I drew the thin, leather-bound book out of my bag and pushed it across the wooden kitchen counter towards her. This book is in a language I don't understand, and I was wondering if you can decipher it. Clarissa frowned this time. I'm not sure if I can, but I'll try. Linguistics isn't exactly my forte. Your grandfather might be a better choice there. She drew the book towards her and opened the first page, staring down. Clarissa glanced up at me. Um, it's blank. What? I pulled the book back and stared down at the page. 
the plain white page. Ah, uh, I have no idea what happened. I swear there was writing there. Clarissa laughed softly and poured us each a cup of tea. There probably was. Magical books tend to play tricks on readers. I pulled the tea towards me and took a sip, the soothing flavor of peppermint coursing over my tongue. Oh, that's nice. Fresh peppermint leaves from my garden. Clarissa grinned. Courtney walked over and grabbed the book. When you say magical book, what do you mean? Because I saw the words in the book before we left. There was definitely something there. Clarissa shrugged. Some special books are written for certain people to read. Considering we're the same bloodline, I would have expected us to be able to see the same thing, but see how there isn't even a title on the front cover. I nodded, taking the book from Courtney and running my fingers over the cover. The moon was so pretty and reminded me so much of a wolf shifter logo. Do you think it's worth asking our grandparents about it? Clarissa shrugged one shoulder. You could. But they'll only be able to help if they can see the language. I glanced over at Courtney. She said she'd seen books with the same language there also. Worth a shot. She nodded. Yeah, and they want to see you. They've asked several times for me to bring you along when I visit. Really? I asked. Since when? Courtney glanced away and shrugged. Was she hiding something, or did she just want to keep our family to herself? The would be weird. And not very Courtney. Shall we go? I asked her. She nodded. Yeah. Let's go. We thanked Clarissa for the tea and assistance, and headed off to the much larger and much grander house that was home to the High Warlock and his wife from the last generation. Why didn't you tell me, they've been wanting me to visit? I asked Courtney as we walked up to the front door. She cleared her throat in an awkward way. They uh don't like shifters. My jaw dropped. What? She stared at me pointedly. You heard me. Oh my god. Of course they don't. Then where do they think I live? Who I'm dating? Courtney stepped closer and whispered, You live by yourself in town in an apartment near the library. And you are not dating anyone. Hide that ring. I grabbed my beautiful engagement ring, pulled it off my finger, and shoved it into the secret compartment inside my bag. I can't believe we're doing this. The door swung back, and an older version of my father stood staring at me. Bella. Wonderful to see you. I went into the house in a bit of a daze, lying in almost every sentence I spoke. Courtney was as smooth as silk whereas I was as awkward as an ass. I hated it. When I showed the book to my grandparents, neither of them could see anything on the pages either, and I left disheartened and no closer to the truth than before. I trudged out of their house. Well that was a waste of time. Courtney opened the gate and walked beside me back to the portal. Yes and no, she said with a secretive smile. What did you do? I asked. She chuckled. You know when I went to the bathroom? I grabbed that book I'd been talking about. The one with the same writing. She patted her butt cheek, where I assume she'd used magic to store the cumbersome book in her jeans pocket. Awesome. I grinned. Well done. Courtney pulled out her gold portal jumping card and swiped it. Well thank you very much. The portal shimmered and Courtney disappeared through it. I slid my hand into my bag and grabbed my ring, sighing with relief as the weight of the silver wrapped around my finger once more. I'd felt terrible removing it, but now that it was back, I wasn't taking it off again. I jumped through the portal and traveled back to the home of the High Warlock. It was time we found out what this mystery was all about. Chapter 7 Bella Unfortunately, the book Courtney had borrowed from our grandparents didn't give us much of a clue as to what to do next. The language was the same, but that didn't help since we couldn't read even a word. Annoyingly, all the words in our book had reappeared the moment we'd stepped back into my father's office home. It was as though it had been set up this way on purpose in order to ensure that secrets were kept and solutions remained hidden. 
So what else can we do? Courtney asked, pacing around his living room. There was so much energy pent up in her that I was surprised she wasn't running. Arms were thrust around her back, and she was practically stomping the way she had when she was a kid who hadn't gotten her way. Luckily, she had grown up a bit since then and managed to control herself, even if it was only a little. We need to find the League of Witches, I said, speaking aloud more than actually organizing a plan. It was an obvious solution, one I had been repeating over and over again. The only problem was, actually locating them. How would we do that if they're in hiding? Do you think they'd have a meeting place or something? The second I suggested that, I bit my bottom lip. It was stupid. A meeting place. If everything was supposed to be a secret, why meet at all? Wouldn't that pose more of a risk? Unless they were that arrogant. Unless they didn't actually think they had done anything wrong. In fact, I had no reason to believe they had disbanded. Tavlor had said they'd fought the council and lost, but that didn't mean they would have disappeared altogether, did it? People who tended to disagree with the council weren't exactly on best terms with them, but at the same time, would the council have done something drastic for a semblance of control? I didn't know, and couldn't begin to guess. I could only hope that they were still together, were still convening and meeting and discussing things. We needed to find out either way. Courtney flopped down onto the couch and magicked up a chocolate bar. Yeah. Probably. Do you know any location spells that could work with just their book or name or something? She asked in between bites. The sweet aroma of the chocolate wafted through my nostrils, and I was tempted to conjure one up for me. Instead, I walked over to the small kitchen and grabbed a soda out of the fridge, my brain scrolling through all the location spells I knew. Most of them required a lot more than an empty book and intent, and I wasn't sure it was possible for us to obtain everything we needed in order to make it work. Suddenly, a thought hit me so hard and unexpectedly, I nearly dropped the can. Intent. That's it. I carefully placed the soda can on the table and bolted back to the lounge. That's it. I said out loud, which was much easier than holding it back in my head. Intent. I bet a group like this has their location cloaked by intent. If I can prove I only want their help and don't wish them any harm, I might be able to locate them. Courtney conjured up a drink for herself and glanced up at me. I wasn't surprised to see that she had already finished the chocolate. Okay. When? And how? How about now? I suggested, grabbing my bag and pulling out the book. Why wait? Courtney chuckled. Ah, are you forgetting where you are? Dad has so many protection wards on this realm, you'll never be able to get a spell out. Plus, do you want him to know what we're doing? I'm sure there'd be some way for him to figure out what we were up to. I glanced around at the comfortable, warm room. Oh yeah. I forgot. I sighed dejectedly, pressing the book to my chest. I got to my feet and pushed my glasses up my nose. Well, I'm going back to the magical realm. You wanna come? I don't think I can sit around and wait to do this anymore. Not when I could feel myself get closer and closer. Are you going to search out those kick-ass witches? Courtney asked, bringing the rim of the soda can to her lips before taking a long gulp. I nodded. Courtney downed the rest of the drink and grabbed her red sweater off the back of the couch, heading for the door. I'm not missing out on that, she said in a rush. Let's go. I followed Courtney through the door, and we portal jumped all the way back to the magical realm where I worked. My heart rate increased rapidly, not because of the jump itself, but because of what the jump represented. Because we were finally doing something productive that might actually work. I'd like to come see the pack again, if that's okay. Courtney said, taking a deep breath of air as we stepped out into the magical realm. She fluffed her hair as she stretched out her muscles. It's been too long, and I know you've made a lot of improvements. I smiled at her, warmed at the fact she wanted to share my life. The thought made happiness fill my body, and I couldn't help but grin. I'd love to show you the new houses and other improvements. Not that I can take credit for the changes. 
Christian and the PAC have done most of the building. I'm just there for moral support. I just worked at the library and enjoyed a peaceful life. Stopping at the edge of the main road, I glanced up and down the street pursing my lips. I adjusted my glasses as I gently chewed the bottom of my lip. Whatcha thinking? Courtney asked. Well, I began, I'm thinking that maybe we should go to the library to conduct the spell, but... I let my voice trail off, trying to figure out how to vocalize what was going on in my head. Courtney shuddered, flaring her nostrils. It was like she could read my mind. Yeah, I'd rather not. I glanced at her face, surprised to see the unease there. Was she still upset about what happened that night at the library? We were attacked, and I managed to distract the council assassin long enough for Courtney to get away. He'd almost killed me, but Courtney had found our father and he saved me. After the attack, I couldn't wait to get back to work at the same library, but Courtney looked like she didn't even want to visit for an hour. In that case, where should we go? I asked, glancing around at the shop fronts in front of me. We can't go back to the Pax realm. My magic won't work the same there. Not to mention the fact that the wolf shifters had a natural dislike for witchcraft. What about that apothecary you took me to when you turned me into Thumbelina? Courtney said suddenly. Doesn't he help wolf shifters and others? Oliver's? I asked. I haven't been back there since my first visit. Though why, I wasn't sure. He'd been a great asset, and someone my family trusted. That's actually a great idea. I said to her. Let's go. We took off across the road, and walked down the street towards Oliver's shop. So, what are you thinking for your wedding? Courtney asked suddenly. Something small. Low key. I elbowed her in the ribs. No. I want a hundred people staring at me like at Ava's wedding. We kept walking, further away from the center of town. Oliver's shop was about three blocks down, in the less reputable area. Courtney laughed at my response. Yeah, I know you're different, so I kinda figured you'd want something smaller. Very different, I agreed, then made a turn down a darker alley and felt a strange shimmer of something passing over my neck. It felt almost like a cloaking spell. I glanced around. Keep your wits about you. Something feels off. Courtney nodded and looked from side to side. We crept forward, then moved a little faster. I used my magic and searched for the reason behind the creepy feeling, but couldn't find any person or reason for it. Still, my heart pounded too fast and my instinct said something was wrong. There's his shop, I said, pointing to the dark glass front window. Courtney nodded, and we hurried even faster along the cobblestones. When we reached the door, I pushed it open and practically fell inside with relief. Fella. And is that Courtney? Two of the heirs to the high warlock in my shop. What an honor. I glanced up and met the amused gaze of my father's school friend. Oliver. Long time no see. His once purple hair was now longer and aqua blue. His eyelids were painted with silver, and his gorgeous hands were decorated with the most beautifully crafted ornate rings I'd ever seen. I closed the door behind Courtney and walked forward. Hi. Oliver cackled out a laugh, swept his arms out wide, then scooped me up into a big welcoming hug. Unlike the first time he hugged me, I didn't feel awkward or overwhelmed. I hugged him back and sighed as his immense aura folded around me. Living with Christian and the pack had made me much more aware of people, and the need for affection. It's nice to see, I said as he pulled back. And you remember Courtney. He grinned and moved to hug my sister, who held him just as tight. How could I forget? Damn girl, you're one tough witch. Courtney laughed, but I didn't miss the sparkle of unshed tears in her eyes. Well, I have you and Clarissa to thank for bringing me back to the land of the living. He glanced at me. And your sister. She has more talent in her pinky finger than most fully trained witches have in their whole bodies. I blinked at the compliment, but didn't really get to process the thought before Oliver was clapping his hands and walking back towards his counter. So, how can I help you two today? I hope Ava is well. 
and you don't need any help with any new poisons? He said it as a joke, since he grinned and laughed as he said it. But a shiver coursed down my spine at the mention of my sister being in trouble. Ava's due to have her baby soon, I informed. Is there anything you recommend that would help in any way? Oliver's brow furrowed. The child is a quarter fay, is it not? I nodded. Yes. She's having Tavlor's baby, so it'll be three quarters warlock and a quarter fay. Oliver went to a glass cabinet and pulled out an amulet. The issue with crossbreeding, especially with the fay, can be the amount of magic coursing through the baby during the birthing process. Fay are not only powerful, but they live for over a thousand years. He handed me the amulet. This is designed to give inner peace and help with the pain of childbirth. If she would like something more specific to her needs, she can see me, but I would recommend she speak to a fay healer. They may be able to help her more than I. I pulled out my coin purse and handed him some currency. Thank you so much. He smiled and inclined his head in thanks. Courtney was wandering around the shop looking at the beautiful jewelry and gems, the potions and books. Oliver leaned closer. She is still struggling from the effects of the poison still. I nodded. She doesn't tell me much, but yes. I believe so. Can you help her? He shook his head. I've done everything I can. I glanced towards my beautiful sister and my heart ached. She was so young and so vibrant still. But even I could see the dark smudges beneath her eyes and the tainted darkness within her aura. So, Miss Bella, I hear congratulations are in order. My bead swung back around to Oliver. I. He pointed to my hand. I crafted that ring. It will keep you safe. My jaw dropped. Christian bought the ring from you. He nodded. I'd met Christian for the first time inside this shop. Oliver was part wolf shifter and helped a lot of people in the community avoid being detected by the council. Yes, he did. He wanted something beautiful, but magical also. I brought my hand up and touched the ring noticing for the first time how much engraving there truly was. Oliver, I love it. I feel sad when I take it off. Why would you take it off? He frowned at me. I sighed. I had to go and visit my grandparents, and Courtney told me to take it off so they wouldn't see it. He shook his head. Don't take it off. It is designed only for you and will enhance all of your powers. You intuition, your spelling. My jaw dropped. Thank you so much. I was truly humbled at his gift. He tilted his head once more at me. What have you come here for today, Bella? I straightened up, getting back to business. I need to do a location spell on a group of people who may not want to be found, and I was wondering if I could use your back room to do so. He walked towards the curtain and held it out for me. Of course you may. I called out to Courtney. You want to come? She shook her head. Nah. I want to browse a bit longer. Okay, won't be long. I headed to the back of the shop, and Oliver was right behind me. May I ask who you are searching for, Bella? I pulled the leather-bound book out of my bag and showed him. The League of Witches. Oliver burst out laughing. A strange chill coursed over my spine that was warm not cold which seemed odd. I stared at him. You know who they are, don't you? He laughed again, his eyes lighting up with yellow magic. Of course I do. I can't believe it's taken you so long to find us. Chapter 8 Bella I gaped at him. Was he serious? It's you, isn't it? You're the leader of the resistance. Even saying it sounded strange like the words didn't quite fit together the way they needed to. Oliver cackled, pulling back his long blue hair and tying it in a low ponytail. I wouldn't put it like that. I raised an eyebrow, crossing my arms over my chest. He was toying with me, something I didn't appreciate. How would you put it? He grinned, his white teeth flashing at me. Well, I believe that everyone should have the right to live free and without fear, he said as though it was obvious. Except, 
that didn't really answer the question. Who was he exactly, and what was his role in all of this? I put a hand on my hip and stared at him, waiting. When he didn't elaborate further, I sighed. I was ready to pull my glasses from my face, so I could pinch my nose between my fingers. Okay. So, do I need to do this location spell or not? I asked. I needed answers, and right now, he was wasting my time, something I didn't appreciate. His laugh rumbled out of him this time. I didn't understand. Even I knew I wasn't this funny. More than that, I hated how he believed everything that came out of my mouth was filled with humor, when all I wanted was for him to take it more seriously. No. I handed him the book. Maybe he could help me in a different way. Can you make this readable for me? I asked instead, trying to keep the attitude out of my voice. He opened the first page. You can see the writing? I nodded. Yes. But it seems like a language I've never even seen before. It's all diamonds and squiggles. I can't make any sense of it, and the research I've already done hasn't shown me what language that even is. Oliver closed the book and held it out in front of him. Put your hand on here and repeat after me. I pressed my lips together, surprised he would be so willing to help. I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for him to tell me he wanted something from me in return. But so far, he hadn't asked for any of those things. Instead, I kept my mouth closed and listened exactly as he instructed. I placed my left hand on top of the book, with my engagement ring shining in the dim light. A small reminder as to why I was doing this in the first place. My heart clenched at the sight of it, but I pushed down any bubbling emotions with a swallow. The last thing I needed right now was for him to think I couldn't handle myself. I believe in the power of choice, of love, of right, Oliver said, and I repeated the words back to him slowly. I will never betray a member of the League of Witches, and I will fight for the rights of people who are weaker than I. I smiled as I repeated the second line, believing inside my heart of the truth in every word. It was strange. These words filled me with a sense of empowerment, and saying them seemed to reaffirm I could do absolutely anything. Oliver nodded and pulled the book back, then opened it for me once more. He gestured at it with his hand. What do you see? I narrowed my eyes at the book, then gasped at the words I saw. There on the first page was the title. Welcome of the League of Witches. I had to make sure this wasn't some kind of trick. What if the title appeared, but the rest of the book was still in that language? I took the book back from him, careful not to snatch it rudely out of his hands and flip through the pages. It's a manual of sorts, I muttered, skimming the words, all of which I understood. Yes, with our philosophies and rules. A simple book of what is. I glanced up at him. Will anyone else be able to read this if they see it? I asked. He shook his head. No. This is only for you. You recited the incantation. You're the one who pledged your loyalty with your hand on the cover. The contents have revealed themselves to you and only you. What about Courtney? I asked. Oliver crossed his arms over his chest. I'm not sure. I know she may want to fight. She has a good heart. But I'm afraid she isn't stable or strong enough for this. There was a sudden crash from the front room, and Oliver took off down the hall. I was hard on his heels, clutching the book to my chest, not wanting to lose contact with it for one moment. I wasn't sure if that would affect the book in any way, if there was a chance the words would go back to the way we were, or the book itself would lock me out. After another moment, the two of us burst into the room. We found Courtney collapsed onto the floor. Courtney! I rushed over to her and knelt beside her, pushing her curly hair off her face. I set the book down next to me, my concern reserved only for my sister. What happened? Are you okay? She was lying on her side amidst a pile of smashed crystals and discarded books. She'd knocked over one of the display cabinets, too. Wake up! I called to her, but she was unconscious and deathly pale. I put my fingers to her throat to feel for her pulse. It was there, rapidly beating under my fingers. Oliver! 
I looked around the room and found the warlock walking over slowly. I called your father. He's on his way. Oliver's brows were knitted together as he knelt down on the opposite side of Courtney. He ran his hand over the top of her, whispering an incantation. I stared up at him, unable to speak due to the heavy lump in my throat. When he looked at me again, worry creased the edges of his eyes. She's stable but she isn't well. We need to get her to Clarissa as soon as possible. The bells above the door flew off their strings as my father burst into the shop. Oliver. Down here, Oliver answered and Dad rushed over, dropping down to put his hands on my sister's pale face. What happened? he asked, assessing her just as quickly as Oliver had. We, nothing. I gulped, tears burning my vision. She just collapsed. Dad picked her up in his arms. I need to get her to help. Go to Clarissa, Oliver said. Now. Can you give me a boost? Dad asked, glancing at Oliver. The part wolf shifter nodded, putting one hand on Dad and the other on Courtney. Matlock. Go. And my sister and father disappeared into thin air. My jaw dropped. What, how? Oliver shivered, then shook off his hands as though dusting them off. I have wards on my shop that don't allow certain magic. Matlock needed help to transport out of here. To get into his family realm takes a lot of power too, so I gave him a boost. Oliver staggered sideways and I rushed to hold him up. You okay? He nodded. Yes, that just took a lot out of me. Lock the shop door and we'll go in the back and talk for a while. I rushed to lock the front door and turn the sign around to say it was closed. Then I followed a hobbling Oliver into the back where he collapsed into a chair. I'm getting far too old for this shit. I sat on a chair nearby and smiled at him. If Oliver was a similar age to my father, then he'd only be 43 or 44. But I could imagine that he'd lived a hard life. Then, out of nowhere, the confirmation I'd been looking for hit me. Of course, I can have a baby with Christian. You're part wolf shifter, aren't you? Oliver stared at me with an intensity I'd never seen before. Then his eyes flashed with the yellow of his shifter. Not many people know that. Did Matlock tell you? Sort of. I asked him if it was true, because I can see the yellow shifter flicker through your eyes. I saw it the first time we came here. Doesn't everyone see it? Oliver relaxed a little into his chair now. No, they can't. My ring hides my shifter. He lifted his hand reminding me of the disguising identity ring I'd picked up on the first day we'd met. Oliver took a deep breath, then exhaled slowly. But you were destined to be mates with a wolf shifter, so perhaps that is why. I picked up the book I'd left in the room and flicked to the first page. Oliver was struggling to breathe and needed to rest, so I read while he recovered. The League of Witches handbook was basically rules surrounding the shifters and fey and mostly how important it was to protect those who do not have the choices or power of the witches and warlocks. The history of the group was interesting. It was set up hundreds of years ago, when the council first decided to kick off any non-witch or warlock member. According to Ava, the council had originally been set up with members of every race. Witches, warlocks, shifters and fey. Then they voted in a high warlock who were my ancestors, and kicked anyone non-magical off the council. Catching up on your history. Oliver asked suddenly, his voice breaking into the silence like a clap of thunder. Whoa. I jumped, almost dropping the book in my surprise. Shit. Sorry. Forgot you were there for a moment. He was standing and composed once more. You've got the color back in your cheeks, I said, closing the books and standing up also. He indicated to the door. My apartment is at the back of this shop. Would you join me for a tea and something to eat? I could use some lunch. I'd love to, I managed to say, surprised more than anything by the invitation. I followed the part shifter, mostly warlock man, through an enchanted door that he opened with a flick of his hand. Then we stepped into an incredibly beautiful home. The walls were white, the kitchen was epic and the furniture was royal in color and size. 
Have a seat, Oliver said, gesturing to the long dining table. I'll get us some nourishment. He went to the kitchen in the open plan living area and began pulling out drinks and bread and meats from the fridge and cupboards. Then he whisked his hands through the air and created platters of sandwiches and colorful jugs of drinks. Wow! That looks fantastic, I said, my mouth watering as he brought over the tray. Thank you. He inclined his head and sat beside me. I think I gave Matlock a little too much power. I haven't felt that weak in a very long time. I reached for the silver goblet he handed me and took a sip of the orange drink. It was sweet and tangy and hinted of a little alcohol. Maybe it was Courtney that weakened you. I suggested. If you tapped into her as well while helping our father, she could have passed some of her poison onto you. He frowned and reached for a beef sandwich. You may be right, not about her poisoning me that is contained. But I may have transferred power to her, and in her weakened state, given too much. We sat in silence for a few minutes as we ate and drank and refilled our stomachs. I hadn't thought I was hungry, but he'd been right. I needed to eat. When we were done, Oliver cleaned up and I glanced around the room. This place is beautiful, Oliver. Thank you, he said. I like it. Part of me wanted to ask him about family, or perhaps a lover he might have. But there were no signs of anyone else, and I was loath to probe into his private life. So what's the next step? I asked. How do I join the League of Witches? Oliver sat back down and stared at me. Why did you think you couldn't have Christian's child? Ava told me I might have trouble, I told him honestly. That a mixed-breed child would be difficult. I'd obviously seen evidence that wasn't the case, and was very happy to hear him correct me. I'm a quarter wolf shifter, Oliver confided, as your niece or nephew will be one quarter fay. My mother died at my birth, and I was told that was unfortunately very common. I gasped at the new information. But I thought we all came from the same original species. Namely, the human. Where did you hear that? I read it in a book in the library. Oliver's eyes lit up with amusement. We planted multiple books in that library many years ago, waiting to see if the next generation had witches who believed the same things we did. But nothing happened. I shrugged. I found three of them. Two I could read, then one I couldn't. Oliver's eyes grew wide. Then you are the one we have been waiting for, Bella. I sat up straighter. So, you'll let me in? Why do you want in? he asked. You haven't explained yet. I want to marry Christian, I said in total honesty. And the warlock laws say I can't. Oliver nodded. More than that. Once the council ascertains how serious you are, if they haven't already, they will try and rectify the situation. I clenched my jaw tight. That's what my father inferred. It's what they do, Oliver said with a long sigh. Fuck up everyone's lives. I leaned forward, placing my left hand on the polished wooden tabletop. We need to stop them, Oliver. They can't keep ruling over people's lives like this. Many have tried before you, Bella, he said, sounding resigned. I leaned back in my chair and crossed my arms over my chest. Well, the High Warlock never sired three daughters before, and I can tell you, when our power is combined, we're one hell of a formidable force. The High Warlock in past generations had one single son, every generation for hundreds of years. My father had unwittingly broken the mold, and together with my sisters, I was going to smash it apart. Chapter 9 Bella I went home to try to relax, and Oliver promised me that he would speak to the rest of the League and organize a meeting. I was anxious to get started with them but terrified as well. This was an exceptionally big deal, and I needed everything to go as perfectly as possible. If it didn't, everything I was working towards would be for nothing, and I couldn't have that. At the same time, a small voice of doubt couldn't help but creep into my thoughts. What would they think of me? I was a nobody. Granted, I might have been my father's daughter, but I wasn't sure that was going to help me or hurt me. My father had a reputation, 
and while he put a great deal of effort into righting the wrongs he had participated in when he was younger, there were a lot of people who didn't like him for his previous mistakes. I wasn't sure if the league was going to hold that against me or give me a chance. When I arrived home, Christian wasn't there yet, so I got some dinner cooking on the stove and sat back with my book. I needed a distraction, and since I couldn't wrap myself up in Christian just yet, a book was the next best thing. At first, it was difficult to concentrate, but after a while I began to immerse myself in the language and the world building, so much so that I didn't even notice when Christian came home until I heard the door close. When he walked into the kitchen, he was sweating and smelled of pine and wood. It made my chest bloom with warmth, and suddenly the book couldn't quite hold my attention the way it had before. Hum. I love your smell, I said as he leaned down to gently kiss me on the lips. I closed my eyes, letting myself get overwhelmed by it. If I could bottle this up like some sort of perfume, I would wear it every day just so I could feel closer to him when we were apart. He chuckled. I find that hard to believe. I'm going for a shower. He wandered over to our bathroom and went inside. I considered following him in there for a time. On the one hand, there was so much to tell him, I nearly burst at the seams just waiting to do so. On the other, I was also twisted up inside about Courtney. How was I supposed to tell him both things when they were so different? What was more important? I put my book down and walked over to the open bathroom door, enjoying the view from where I was standing. My lips curved up slightly as I watched him, once again, pinching my arm at the thought that this man was mine. How could I have gotten so lucky? But it wasn't just his good looks, it was the fact that I could tell him anything. The fact that I could trust him with things I couldn't trust anyone else with. That was what made him so outstanding. That was what made him different. Having realized all of that, I knew I needed to tell him everything, and even if it didn't come out in the most perfect way, Christian would still be there for me. Courtney collapsed today. My voice was just above a whisper, but I knew with his sharp senses, he'd still pick it up with his hearing. Christian had his head tipped back and was washing his hair, but upon hearing my words twisted to look at me, shampoo running down his neck and shoulders. Seriously, he asked with obvious concern. Is she okay? I shrugged, shifting my weight. I don't know, I admitted. I didn't like saying I didn't know something. It was difficult to fit that particular phrase into my vocabulary, especially when it was about my sisters and their well-being. But I also knew I wanted to be honest, and Christian deserved the truth. Our father took her away, transported them both to our family realm where Clarissa lives. Hopefully, they can help her there. That's your cousin with the healing powers? Christian clarified, tilting his head to wash more of the shampoo away. I nodded. I told Christian everything that had happened when I'd first arrived in the realm. Yeah. That's her. Do you know what happened? I sighed and leaned my head against the doorframe. We were investigating this strange book I found in the library and went to Oliver's for help. You went to Oliver's? Christian asked, scrubbing his chest with soap and dunking his head under the shower spray once more. I nodded. Yeah. I was talking to him about the book when Courtney just collapsed. I knew she wasn't quite right. She's been pale and has dark smudges under her eyes. But I didn't know she was that bad. Tears were threatening my composure now. I gulped at the air around me and I tried my best to quell my tears. I'm so sorry, Christian said, turning off the shower quickly drying himself, then wrapping a towel around his waist. He came forward and put his arms around me, offering silent comfort and his strength. I sighed and leaned into him, then let him lead me back to the couch. I sat while he got dressed, then he joined me again. Tell me everything. I wiped at the tears in my eyes. That's the problem, I don't know much more. Oliver said he's done everything he can for her, Clarissa too. And yet she's still having blackouts, dizziness and headaches. I swiped at more tears as they ran down my cheeks. It's not fair. She's 21 years old. She shouldn't have suffered in the way she has. Christian nodded, then tilted his lips up. Does she still have her star? 
the protective one on her belly, that you conjured for her? The change of subject was just what I needed. I smiled and the tears dried up. Yeah she does. Mine's gone, so is Ava's. But Courtney's still got another life on her. I was proud of myself for finding and performing that spell. It had saved Ava's life, and then mine in the library. Christian touched my leg, squeezing my thigh. Now tell me the real reason you went to find Oliver today. I sobered and bit my lip. I have found a book. A book, he repeated, his eyebrows flicking up in surprise. I nodded. Yeah, in the library. I went looking for information on shifters and interbreeding, and all that. I was pretty annoyed that we can't get married legally. I still am, if I'm being honest. Always be honest, Christian said. I took a deep breath, then released it slowly. Anyway, the three books I found on the same topic were all by the same author, League of Witches. Christian frowned. Yeah, I know you don't like them. We'd already had that discussion. But I need to do something, Christian. I can't just sit by while the warlocks dominate everyone else. I want to be a part of a movement that will make a change. For you. For our family. For our future children. I didn't want our babies growing up like Tavlor, feeling out of place, unloved, unwanted. Christian leaned back against the sofa back and groaned. I knew this was going to happen. You can't ignore it, can you? No. I can't, I said simply and waited for him. I never thought I'd be this person. Someone who wanted to affect change. Alter policies. Unseat people in power. But I did. Maybe I am more like Ava than I thought. Finally, Christian's lips kicked up at the side. What if I told you I want you to stay away from the League of Witches? That we're perfectly safe and fine in this realm, and you should ignore the problems of the magical world. I sucked my lips into my mouth and pressed my teeth down, staring at him. Was he serious? Then I saw the other side of his mouth kick up into a smile, and I began to relax. You're baiting me. He shrugged. Had to at least give it a go. I put my hand out to him. If you really, really, really want me to stop, I will. I'd be angry at him, but he knew this world a hell of a lot better than me, and I knew his worry came from a need to protect me. Christian reached over, grabbed me, and hauled me into his lap. Sweetheart, I love you more than anything. Would I prefer that you were always safe? Of course. But will I stop you from fighting the injustices on my people? No. I pressed my head into the crook of his neck and cuddled in. Thank you. We stayed like that for a long time. When I heard Christian's stomach rumble, I got up and served our meal, eating quickly before climbing into bed together. You know, if it comes to a fight, my pack and I will be right beside you, he said quietly into my ear as I was beginning to fall asleep. My eyes sprung open. But you'll get hurt. I felt more than saw his shrug. Won't change the fact that we'll fight with you. I nodded and closed my eyes but now my mind was whirling. I wanted to fight for my own rights and those of the shifters, but I didn't want any of them to get hurt. But how was I going to protect them? The next day, I received a letter from Oliver, hand-delivered by the Pack Alpha. Thank you Max, I said, bowing my head. The older man smiled at me and walked away. The letter was sealed with an elaborate purple wax and smelled of roses. I couldn't help but smile as I broke the seal and opened the single sheet of white linen paper. My dear. We meet this evening. My shop. Midnight. Bring an offering. Oh. An offering. I said aloud. Did he mean I had to bring some food? A book. A spell. I had no idea. So I spent the day reading, cleaning, and practicing some defensive spells, just in case. Christian was of the opinion, and rightly so, that this would probably end in a fight. And I didn't want to be the only one who couldn't protect my family. When Christian came home from work, I told him about the letter. He immediately wanted to come with me. It's pretty late, 
I teased my gut twisting with unease. You'll be tired. I'll have a nap before we go, he said with a grin. I'm not missing out on this. He was true to his word. We had an early dinner, and Christian went to bed at 8 p.m., setting an alarm for 11.30. I couldn't sleep. My mind was too fixated on what we were getting ourselves into, and the offering that Oliver had requested. After two hours of stressing about it, I walked outside into the night and worked a spell. The shifter realm made a lot of my magic muted, a safety against the warlocks that may wish harm on the shifters. But this magic flowed easily and well. I crafted a ring for Oliver. The image was emblazoned into my mind, and so I followed my instincts. The band was yellow gold thick, large and ornate. I conjured a knife and pricked my finger, taking the drop of blood and spreading it out. I worked it with magic I didn't know existed, creating a ruby for the center of the ring. When it was done, I reached out into the air where it hovered and weighed it in my hand. It was beautiful, but what my blood would do I didn't know. I wanted Oliver to have it, and I couldn't fight the desire. Lights flicked on inside our cottage, so I knew Christian's alarm had gone off and he was up and moving. I conjured up a small ring box and placed the golden gift inside. I wrapped both hands around the offering and wondered if he meant I should have bought a plate of scones instead. Hopefully not. I rushed inside and got changed. A warm black, long-sleeved sweater and a patchwork skirt that fell to the floor. Are you nervous? Christian asked as he pulled his gray top over his head and tugged it down over his abs. I nodded. Very. I have no idea what sort of night this is going to be. Do they talk and play games? Or do they strategize and welcome new members like us? Christian shrugged. I suppose we're going to find out, aren't we? What's that? He pointed to the ring box. A gift I made for the offering, I answered, then slipped it into one of the pockets hidden within the folds of my skirt. Oh that's right, he said, yawning loudly and rubbing his eyes. Midnight really was a terrible time for a wolf shifter. Shall we go? He nodded and reached out for my hand. I interlinked my fingers with his and walked out the front door of our cottage, down the path, and through the veil protecting our realm. Who do you think will be there? I whispered to him as we walked down the cold, dark streets of the town. None of the shops were occupied, but at least the streetlights cast enough glow to make it possible to walk without tripping. Not sure, he whispered back. Oliver, obviously. And some other witches, maybe? No idea. I didn't have any clue either. We walked side by side down the street, turned right, then left, and found the alleyway where Oliver's shop resided. My heart thumped in my chest and my belly was as tight as a drum. Ready to go in, he asked me as we stopped and stared up at the darkened shop. There was no sign of life anywhere, and the closed sign hung on the door. I nodded. Yes. Let's go. I took out the invitation, assuming I'd need it for entry, and walked towards the door, my hands trembling. With my eyes trained firmly on the front door, I took one step forward, then another. Was the door going to be locked? Then suddenly, I felt it. The shimmer of magic coursing over the door. Hold my hand, I told Christian, who immediately reached out for my extended arm. I moved forward, the coolness of a portal shift passing over my face. I kept walking, passing through the void of space and surfacing on the other side. I kept moving forward, dragging Christian with me. When I glanced around, we were inside Oliver's shop. Ah, that was odd. I looked around, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Not that I could see anyway. Can you hear that? Christian asked, walking towards the back of the shop. I listened, but couldn't hear anything. No. Let's go this way, he urged, walking behind Oliver's desk and down the hallway. I hurried after him, trusting the fact that shifters had much better hearing than I did. Then I heard it. Whispers. We walked down the hall, then were standing in front of the door that led to Oliver's apartment. There was no doorknob or even doorbell. But someone must have heard us because the door swung open, and there stood Oliver, in all his royal purple glory. 
I was wondering how long it would take you to find us. Come on in. Chapter 10 Bella I stepped through the door and reached for my gift buried in my skirt. I sucked in a breath, trying not to show Oliver I was nervous. I have the offering for you. I pulled out the box and handed it to him. Thank you for inviting us. Oliver's eyebrows lifted in surprise, but he didn't say anything. I wasn't sure if he was surprised at my thanking him, or the gift itself, but the fact that he so openly showed that surprise was something that would have made me grin had the circumstances not be as dire as they were. Instead, he only nodded his thanks and I walked inside, my heart now pounding in worried excitement. I was finally here. This was my opportunity to make things right, and I couldn't let it slip from my fingers. Hello, I said to the room, smiling at the people who sat on the chairs and couches. There were more than ten people present, and from what I could tell, from a broad spectrum of races. They all stared at me, and I forced myself not to look away. As much as I wanted to ignore the way their eyes flickered on me, I looked back at them with that same curiosity, trying to figure out who created them and what they were. There were two witches and another warlock, all dressed well in black, but with carefully brushed hair and noses an inch too high in the air. But there weren't just witches and warlocks as I'd first assumed. There was also a fey male, who was dressed in long flowing white robes. He looked about thirty years old, with beautiful skin and long hair. But with the way fey didn't age and lived forever, he could be five hundred years old, and I wouldn't be able to tell. My gaze finally moved around the room and found two female shifters. Wolves, I assumed, but they definitely had an unusual vibe about them. They were both dressed in biker-type gear. Leather jackets and punk-style hairdos. When Christian walked in behind me, their gazes lit up with interest. Instantly, my first instinct was to knock them into next week. I had never been the possessive type, but Christian seemed to bring that out in me, and I was trying not to let it show. Jealousy was an emotion that wasn't exactly logical, and wasn't going to help my relationship, which had a solid foundation of trust. Instead, I pushed the emotion away, trying not to let it linger as I continued to eye the two. Their heated gazes rested on Christian and only Christian, as though I wasn't even there in the first place. Yes. Definitely wolf shifters. I tried not to smirk when he walked in and put an arm around my waist. Yep, he's mine. Sorry, not sorry. Maybe jealousy wasn't completely missing, because I might have leaned into him just a bit to show them who he belonged to. They looked away, scowling. This time, I did grin, and I didn't even care. I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight, especially on such short notice, Oliver announced before he glanced down at the box in his hand and smiled at me as he put it into his pocket. Bella came to me yesterday, in search of the League of Witches. She wishes to align herself with a group of people who want equal rights for all the citizens in this world, not just the warlocks. I was listening to what he was saying, but I was also very aware of the fact he'd put my gift away. Had I misinterpreted the word offering? He didn't think it meant something it didn't, right? Unless I'd completely misunderstood the word. I stopped thinking about it needing to pay attention, certain what he was saying would be important. I'd find out later, I guessed. The whole group turned towards me. Their expressions weren't hostile, rather more interested than anything else. Even the wolf shifters, while annoyed, didn't look like they wanted to kill me for having Christian wrapped up against me. I smiled but knew it probably came out shaky. I didn't do well in front of others the way my sisters did. My fingers itched to find a book somewhere and hide behind it. Thank you for having me, I managed to get out. And you brought Christian as well, Oliver said, reaching out to shake my fiancé's hand. Nice to see you, as always. Oliver then turned to the room with a commanding presence, as he looked around. People naturally seemed to pay attention to him, as though his words alone were powerful enough to affect them. Bella, tell everyone why you want to join us. He swept his arm at those already seated. I gulped. Me. He wanted me to speak in front of these people? I should have expected it, but I couldn't stop the shot of surprise. 
Christian gave my hip a reassuring squeeze and I took a deep breath. As much as I wanted to crawl under my bed and hide, I knew this was important and it had to come from me. As such, instead of freaking out, I lifted my chin and pushed myself to speak. I could do this, after all. I'm a witch, as most of you would know. My voice came out a little shaky, but as each word came out, I grew stronger and more confident in what I was saying. And my fiancé, Christian, is a wolf shifter. In my world, we can't be married or have children together. I know that seems like a very small thing, and I should be able to get over it, but I can't. I think we all deserve to be able to love who we want, live how we want, and raise a family together, especially a family born of love. And I am sick to death of the discrimination and hatred that all of us face. By the end of my little speech, everyone was smiling. It almost seemed as though they were in complete and utter agreement. I almost sagged against Christian with relief, but I managed to keep it together. Oliver sat on a high stool nearby. Our founder always said that with equal rights to love come equal rights to live, and the council will never allow such a thing. I sighed. They're right. The council wants to keep everyone down and powerless. Then we need to fight back, the Fae said, pointing to his chest. I know that we, the Fae, have not been treated as badly as the shifters have, but we deserve to make decisions about our own lives. Our elders deserve a place on the council. I nodded like they were in the original days. Everyone turned towards me. Pardon, the Fay asked. I swallowed hard against the urge to run away. I thought everyone knew. I found a book in my mother's things that explained the origins of the council. Originally, there were members of every race on the council. Fay, shifters, witches and warlocks. There was a general gasp, then Oliver began to chuckle those bastards. Then he was laughing and shaking his head. I stared at him, wondering if I'd pushed him over the edge of something and hadn't realized it. I glanced up at Oliver, who shrugged. But finally, he settled and stood. I think that's enough revelations for the evening. Is everyone in favor of allowing Bella and Christian to attend the next official meeting? Everyone in the room nodded and were dismissed. Stay, Bella, Oliver said, holding onto my arm while I would have left also. I did, of course. Christian and I sat on the large couch and waited for Oliver to come back from seeing everyone out. So we joined a new club, huh? Christian said with a smile. I nodded. Yeah. I can't believe they all came just to decide if I was allowed to attend an official meeting. That's dedication. Oliver waltzed back into the room and took out my gift box. What have you brought me, Bella? I shifted in my chair, suddenly uncomfortable again. I, you said to bring an offering, and I thought you meant a gift. He grinned. I was teasing. I apologize, it's just my strange sense of humor. Most people bring a plate of food or a book or something. But this. He snapped open the box and gasped. Bella. Heat suffused my cheeks. I don't know where it came from. I just walked outside and was thinking of what you liked, and how sometimes your wolf eyes still show despite your ring protecting you and I. I shrugged. Was that what the ring would do for him? Desk eyes all signs that he was a shifter? His gaze flicked up to mine. How did you make the ruby? This made me uncomfortable, and I squirmed where I sat on the couch. I used a drop of my blood. Oliver's eyes widened, then he slowly and reverently slipped the ring onto his middle finger. Perfect fit, he whispered. He looked unusually moved by the gesture, and it was making me more and more uncomfortable. I'm sorry if I overstepped. I know you're the jewelry maker, after all. I glanced down at my hand, where my gorgeous ring hugged my finger. This is very special, Bella. Thank you for this gift. I glanced up at Christian, who was smiling down at me, pride in his eyes. You're welcome. Thank you for getting me in touch with the League. Oliver lifted his head, finally meeting my gaze once more, and there wasn't a shadow of a shifter in his eyes. That is only about a third of the members, but they were a good sampling. Now that they know who you are, 
the next meeting will be interesting. I nodded and said something that had been brewing in my mind for days, I want to commission the council to change the laws. Christian groaned beside me, and Oliver's lips quirked up at the edges as though he were amused. That easy. I nodded. Yes. Why shouldn't it be? My father is the high warlock, and it's just one of their rules. Surely it can't be that difficult to change. I glanced from Christian to Oliver and back again. Their faces were twisted up with emotions I couldn't quite decipher, but it seemed like they were trying not to laugh at me. Why can't I ask? I demanded. Surely I could request an exception? Then once we get that to pass, it will be easier for everyone else. Oliver sat up straighter, his face going serious. That's a way to do it. It's possible, right? I asked again, reaching over and squeezing Christian's thigh. He sighed. I don't like it, but yes. It is definitely a small step they might accept. Especially if your father would back us up. I grinned at them both. He's been on our side so far. He built us a new realm, houses protected you. Christian nodded, but the grimace on his face hadn't gone away. What's wrong? You know you're putting yourself in danger for us? For me. I leaned forward and kissed him softly. We have to do something. This isn't right. When I pulled back, the conversations with my father were already forming in my mind. I could convince him, I was sure. Right. Chapter 11 Bella Convincing my father to change the marriage rules for me, was going to be harder than I'd let on to Christian and Oliver. I knew that and they did too. But false confidence and a whole lot of hope was all I had right now. In truth, I knew my father wanted to do the right thing. After everything he had learned about us, I was sure he regretted many of his previous choices. But blatantly going against tradition was already rocking the boat more than he might want to. And, Dot and a small part of me wasn't sure he was going to see it as a battle he wanted to join. Sure, he had his own issues. He'd loved Mother more than anything, and the council made him give her up, simply because she wasn't what the council wanted their ruler to marry. And they were of the same species. More than that, he seemed to approve of Ava and Tavlor, even though Tavlor had mixed blood. Then again, he knew and trusted Tavlor. Did he trust Christian? I wasn't sure the ingrained beliefs he grew up with when it came to werewolves were so easily set aside. Then again, I was willing to try. The next day I went to work tired but happy. Hope burned through my very soul despite the dire circumstances that seemed to surround me. Instead, I reminded myself of what I already had and that seemed to do wonders to keep the darkness away. I had a man who loved me and a group of rebels who wanted me to be a part of their group, who looked at me as capable of offering assistance should they need it. In a world with so much inequality, I would stand beside those that weren't as fortunate as I. I wanted to try to shift the world to make it easily accessible for those left on the outside. I could make a difference. Deep down, I knew I could. My shift at work passed faster than I anticipated, for which I was glad. The last thing I wanted was to wallow in despair or be exhausted because my mind couldn't stop whirling with potential solutions. But I was able to distract myself easier than anticipated, and by the time my shift was over, I was ready to take on my father. After work, I went to the council building to speak to him, moving through the normal amount of security checks as always. 4. Such a drag, and while I knew it wasn't a waste of time, I couldn't help but think there had to be a more efficient way of handling this. By the time I finally reached my father's office, which he'd converted into an apartment, I was exhausted. The adrenaline I had started the day with had been zapped simply by having to prove I wasn't a threat over and over again. I collapsed down onto the sofa and magicked up a hot drink for myself. It was quiet in the apartment, too quiet for my liking. I didn't think anyone was home but I called out anyway, hello. Father. Courtney. Then a jolt of pain hit me. Courtney couldn't be here. She'd collapsed yesterday, 
and our father had taken her to Clarissa for treatment. I still hadn't found out how she was. I really needed to speak to her or dad as soon as possible. I couldn't believe I had so easily forgotten such a thing. Had I really been that distracted? I shook my head. Guilting myself wouldn't help. I checked the time from the clock hanging on the wall. 5.30 p.m. He'd be here soon. My foot tapped on the floor with my impatience, and I took a sip of my drink. Relaxation began to replace the exhaustion, and I hummed to myself. I was here. I would get somewhere, no matter what. I would find answers. I would, I would make progress, no matter what that might look like. I closed my eyes and lifted my legs so I could curl up on the couch for a minute. So much was happening at the moment, and the lack of sleep really wasn't helping my brain function. In fact, what I thought was adrenaline might have been exhaustion driving me mad. Anything was possible at this point. Another sip of my drink met my lips and sighed again. It would be so easy to fall asleep here, to drift off. I must have dozed off because the next thing I knew, my father was shaking my shoulder softly. Bella. Oh, uh. I sat up, wiping the drool from my chin. Sorry, I must have fallen asleep. I wasn't sure if I should wake you, so I hope I chose correctly. He sat down on the couch opposite me. My father looked tired and was wearing all black without his normal flourish of color. That didn't bode well for his mood. Are you all right? I asked, taking a sip of my now cold hot chocolate. He groaned out a sigh. Yeah, just a lot going on. But there always is. I slid to the edge of the couch. How's Courtney? My father ran a hand through his hair, tugging it out of a low ponytail. The strands fell around his shoulders, and I couldn't help but stare at him. He was a handsome man, though that was a strange thing to admit. But in this minute, I could partly see why my mom had been so enamored with him. Then he was straightening up and fixing his hair, and his youth disappeared all at once. Courtney isn't great, he said then looked directly at me, his stare reading my soul. But we can talk about your sister in a moment, if that why you came here. Or is there something else? I inhaled sharply, my flight or fight mechanism making my legs shake. I wanted to run away from this awkward conversation, but I couldn't. There was more than my life at stake here. I want to ask the council to allow my marriage to Christian to be made legal. Here. Everywhere. I don't want to just do a bonding ceremony with the pack. My father's lips thinned but he didn't speak. I waited quietly, the patience I'd inherited from my father taking over. Silence didn't intimidate me. After long minutes he said, I'm not sure that's possible Bella. I frowned at him, unable to ignore the stabbing pain around my heart. Why not? He sat up straighter. Because those laws have been in place since well before my grandparents were even born. I shrugged my shoulders. So. That makes them outdated and antiquated. He groaned and pinched his nose. I can't just waltz up to the council and demand they change this law for you, Bella. My power within the council is limited already. I clenched my hands together in my lap, changing my direction. Would it be possible to ask them for an exception? For me? My father seemed to relax a little, his face smoothing out from the lines furrowed into his brow. Ah, that might be possible. Though you understand they would demand some sort of payment for such a gift. I wanted to scoff. Gift? For the right to be like everyone else. I'd like to ask them. Would it be best for me to come with you? Definitely, he answered, conjuring up a pitcher of water and two glasses, then pouring us each a drink and setting them on the coffee table between us. I could arrange a meeting, perhaps tomorrow or the following day. I nodded. Thank you. That would be enough, at least for the moment. A foot in the door. I picked up the glass and took a sip of water, the tasty zest of lemon making me smile. Nice. I shifted on the couch to move, to stand up and probably leave, but my father's next words stayed me. There's something else, Bella. You mean about Courtney? 
He was going to tell me she wasn't well, that she was still unconscious, that the poison was spreading. He clenched his jaw, making his cheek flex. Yes, but also. My chest tightened and my stomach swooped, making me feel sick. What is it? What had they found out? Please, please, please tell me Courtney isn't dying. I couldn't bear it. It's Ava. Sorry. My hand flew up to my chest and pressed against my thumping heart. What do you mean, it's Ava? What's Ava? I'd seen my sister a few days ago, and she'd been glowingly healthy. Grumpy and swollen, but so beautiful. Her pregnancy is causing her some issues now. Tears were burning in my eyes, and I jiggled my legs to try and expend some of the bad energy. What do you mean? I just saw her. And she'd been fine. Fine. Ava's baby is part fay, and that in itself can be stressful on a witch. You mean because the baby's a crossbreed? I gulped at the air around me, as tears blurred my vision. Bella please calm down. I got to my feet and began to pace around the room, unable to stand still. I can't stay calm. Both of my sisters are sick. And Ava's baby, oh my god, tell me the baby's okay. My father got to his feet also and conjured up two tumblers of an amber liquid. Here. Have a drink. I took the small glass with shaking hands. What is it? A strong port. It'll help with your nerves. Just sip it. I did as he asked, the liquor burning my throat but forcing the tears away. I sipped and sipped until there was none left, then my father filled the tiny glass again. Let's sit down. My stomach burning, I agreed with him. I collapsed onto the couch, cradling the glass in my fingers. Then I asked the question that I desperately needed a positive answer to. Is Ava going to be okay? My father nodded, his head jerking up and down. She's been moved to ferry. Their healers have her on bed rest. I swallowed hard. They won't let anything happen to her. Tavlor certainly wouldn't. He'd fought the council to keep Ava safe. Surely he could keep death at bay for the sake of his child and wife. Um, what about Courtney? He eyed me. Are you sure you can handle it? A single tear slipped out and I brushed it away. Yes. Please. Hit me with everything at once. A loud sigh filled the room. Unfortunately, we just don't know. Courtney seems to be getting worse, and yet there's no reason for it. Clarissa is looking after her, and she's still unconscious. So we just wait. I nodded, gulping the air to clear the lump in my throat. This is a lot. Hell yeah, it is. My father pulled out my mother's old locket, from where he'd had it hanging around his neck, underneath his shirt. I don't think your mother will ever forgive me, if something happens to one of her daughters. I managed to smile at that. We're your daughters too. He huffed out a laugh. Yeah you are. But she. He shook his head, the locket still clasped in his hand. Is mother still in there? I asked, pointing to the locket. Ava said she was, but we never heard her voice. My father stared at me, his dark eyes showing a vulnerability I'd never seen before. Yes. She is. He didn't want to share her, that was obvious. He clung to the locket like it was a lifeline. I smiled at him, not wanting to push at him at this moment in time. I'd had my mother in my ear my whole life, and he'd barely seen her in over twenty years. It made sense that he wanted to hold on to her now. Say hello to her for me, okay? He finally moved to remove the locket. Would you like to talk to her? No. I held up my hand and slowly got to my wobbly feet. The alcohol was trickling through my legs like warm fire. I struggle with my own thoughts in my head. I'll leave you with mom for the moment. But I appreciate the offer. He slipped the golden locket and chain inside his plain black shirt once more. The offer is there. If you need her, just ask. I made a mental note of that and walked towards the door. Thank you for all the news, though it's mostly bad. It's good to know what's going on. As I reached for the door handle, I remembered the main reason I came. 
and thank you for saying you'd ask the council for the exemption. It would mean a lot to me. My father nodded and lifted one arm. I saw the request, though it was subtle, and leaned in for a hug. My mother hadn't been very affectionate, so the feeling of my father's arms enclosing me felt foreign but nice. I closed my eyes and inhaled his familiar scent. This is nice. Then he was pulling away, and I was back in a world where everything was against us. I'll speak to you tomorrow. I asked. He nodded. Yes. See you soon. And be careful, yeah. I smiled. I'll be fine. And I walked out the door, having partly accomplished what I'd come here to achieve. Sort of. I wandered home, disheartened despite my win. My father would ask the council for an exemption for my marriage, which was the foot in the door the League needed to change the laws. And I'd fight alongside them for that change. With the equal rights to love, come the equal rights to live, and the council will never allow that. Those words haunted me, circling inside my mind. What a horrible thing to believe. And the worst part. It was true. I rounded the corner and glanced up from the footpath, and there was the hidden door to our realm just ahead. Unfortunately, between myself and safety were two men dressed in black. And they did not look friendly. What was worse? It appeared they had their sights set on me, and that they were heading straight towards me. Chapter 12 Bella It's all right. You're all right. I tried to reassure myself, as the men continued to move with grace in my direction. I wouldn't have suspected much of them, had they not been wearing such ominous clothing or been staring straight at me. If that wasn't a dead giveaway as to their true intent and purpose, I didn't know what was. My heart began to pound, sick and heavy in my chest. I thrust my hands behind me, hoping it would keep me from being obvious and wiping them across my clothes in order to get rid of the accumulated perspiration. I slowed my walk to an amble and kept my gaze fixed on the two men in front of me. I knew there was no point in running, especially since I hadn't done anything wrong. I also didn't want to give them a reason to suspect me of anything if all of this was in my head, which I was pretty positive it wasn't. But still. As I got closer, I forced myself to study them. Might as well try to see just what I was dealing with here. They looked like warlocks. There wasn't a pointed ear or flash of yellow eyes between their two strong faces. Can I help you gentlemen? I called out as strong as I could. I was sick and tired of waiting for them to make the first move, when I had the power to be in control of the situation. They were at least ten years older than me, and each of them weighed double what I did. If this came down to a fight, I was in trouble. I wasn't good at hand-to-hand -hand combat, and I was sure they had much more experience than I did. Then again, who said it had to be a physical fight? I put my shoulder bag over my head so it now hung across my body, and got my hands ready to defend myself just in case. The best strategy I possessed in any scenario was being prepared, and having a backup plan in case something went wrong. Plus, all I needed to do was get out of here successfully. Once I was through the veil, they wouldn't be able to touch me. But I had to get through it first. That was the problem, one I hoped to be able to handle. They still hadn't spoken, and they were now standing shoulder to shoulder, glaring at me silently and blocking the entrance. I stopped walking. I couldn't call my father from here, though making a run for it was possible. Maybe. At this point, I didn't care about what they thought of me. It was clear they weren't friendly, and they were suspicious of the very nature as to why I was here in the first place. Running might have to be an option, and while their girth gave me little confidence that they would have the power to catch me, I had been wrong before. Maybe I could call someone else. I began to think about the variety of people I knew, who would rush to my defense. I couldn't call Christian from here, and I wouldn't want him to fight two warlocks anyway. The last thing I needed was a wolf, fighting two magical beings, all while I was trying to fight for equal rights. Even if the two bastards deserved the fight and basically asked for it, Christian wouldn't come out of it looking good. I couldn't put him through that, even though I knew he would have done anything for me, 
especially if it resulted in my safety. Looks like you're going to have to do this yourself, Bella. Unfortunately, the voice in my head was right. I couldn't call anyone to fight this battle for me. It had to be me. As such, I channeled one of my new spells, covering myself in a shield just in case they decided to attack with no warning, and tried again. Can you please move out of the way? I asked, not bothering to pretend that I didn't need to go directly behind them. They obviously knew where the veil was, and didn't want me getting home. At this point, I was tired of playing games and didn't want to waste any more time. The guy with long black hair threw a bolt of magic at me, not even bothering to answer my question. I yelped as it struck my shield right in the chest where my heart was. If my shield hadn't been there. Fuck he's aiming to kill. My shield held firm, and I diverted some of my magic into it to make it stronger. Oh my god, what do I do? The other warlock advanced on me, stretching out his arm and pulsing fire at me. With each strike my shield weakened and my fear rose. I couldn't take too much more. Fight sweetheart. Fight. The voice in my head came from nowhere, but I knew it was my father. I inhaled quickly and got into a fighting stance. I knew the spells and had been preparing for this. I cast spell and after spell, walking forward with every throw of my magic at them. Ice and snow, flames and fire, I hit them with everything I had. But it wasn't enough. They were taking each hit, glaring at me as though I had no right to fight back. A sudden blast of white magic hit them from behind me, but I didn't risk glancing back. Apparently, I had company and help. That was all I needed. I kept advancing, throwing everything I had at them. My magic wasn't depleting, it was growing as was my anger. Get. The. Fuck out of my way. I yelled at them, as I began to pound them with tougher, more damaging magic. Their blood spilled as I cut into their shields, slicing their faces. One of them made a run for it, and the final guy copped a hefty wallop from whoever was behind me, then he turned and bolted away, a trail of blood behind him. I was at the door to the shifter realm now, but had to look back and see who'd come to my aid at the most crucial time. But no one was there. I stared into empty space, panting and out of breath. Hello. No one answered and I had to go. I couldn't withstand another attack like that. So with one more look into the dark street, I slipped through the veil and into our protected realm. Only then could I slump and stagger down the path to my home. Now that it was over, I was trembling and cold. I pushed myself to hurry a little faster down the road. Christian was waiting for me on the porch, like he knew I needed him. Because I did. Bella, he called when he saw me, rushing down the steps and sweeping me up into his arms. What happened? I they. My teeth were chattering now. Let's get you inside and warm you up. Christian carried me inside. He set me on the couch, grabbed blankets from our bed, then came back and bundled me up in his arms. I laid my head against his chest, surrounded by warmth, and willed myself to relax. To breathe. It's okay. You're home. You're home, Christian whispered but I could hear the growl in his voice. His shifter was very close to the surface. The heat of Christian's body and the cocoon of blankets finally made my teeth stop chattering and I relaxed against him. I lifted my head and looked up at him. I had no tears, still in shock. Can you tell me what happened? Christian asked, his voice still shaking. I sat up, beginning to sweat from the amount of heat we were making. I went to see Dad. I asked him about the marriage laws, and he told me he couldn't change the rules. However, when I asked if we could get an exemption, he agreed to ask the council. It still angered me so much that the council had so much power. And my father, who was the high warlock, was only a figurehead of that power. That's good, isn't it? He asked, beginning to relax beneath me also. I nodded. Yeah, but... I wanted to tell him that both my sisters were ill, but that felt like just too much tonight. So, I moved on to the other truth I'd had to deal with. But when I got back to the realm entrance, there were two warlocks there blocking the door. And they attacked me. 
I still couldn't believe it. I was a single woman, alone. Why the hell would they feel the need to attack me? The answer was staring me in the face, of course. I was the high warlock's heir. With Courtney out of the picture, and Ava now on extended leave, I was the only one left strong enough to do any damage to the council's power. Christian was practically vibrating with anger now. You were attacked. I nodded, putting a hand on his chest to reassure him that I was okay. Yes. But they didn't hurt me. I fought back and someone helped me. I don't know who. Whoever it was disappeared once the warlocks left. It must have been another warlock. Or Fae even. The magic had been powerful. The Fae didn't tend to leave Fairy, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility. But why had they left before I could say thanks? It didn't make sense. Whoever it was, thank the heavens the assistance. I nodded, sliding off his lap and gathering the blankets to put them back on the bed. My mind was abuzz with all the new information while I folded the covers and put them back on our mattress. Definitely. Without them. I don't want to think about what would have happened. Christian moved into the kitchen and began pulling things out of the fridge to make dinner. Do you think they were there to capture you? No, I said with certainty. They were there to kill me. Christian rose so quickly he whacked his head on the fridge, making it sway and hit the wall. What the? He straightened and turned around, rubbing the spot on his head where he'd smacked it. Really? Why would someone want to do that? I ambled over to the kitchen chairs and sat down. Maybe because I'm my father's only healthy heir. Huh. I explained to Christian about what had happened to Ava and Courtney, and by the time I was done, he'd collapsed in the chair opposite me with little more than some salad ingredients in his hands. That's insane. I nodded and reached inside myself for my magic. Let's have takeout again. I waved my hand over the table, conjuring Indian cuisine with curry, rice and bread. Christian's face instantly lit up. Thanks. I'm starving. I wasn't. Not at all. But I forced myself to eat a couple of bites because my body needed something to sustain it. I added a few sodas and sighed. This is really shit. Christian nodded. Yep. Your sisters don't deserve to be sick. The fact that Ava was so unwell because she was pregnant with a part fey baby made me sick to my stomach. Was it really that difficult to carry a cross-race baby? Would I have the same problem? Surely not. Do you think it's just because the baby? I couldn't even say it. Is part fey. Christian finished, filling in the gap. Maybe. But how would anyone know? Women are sick and on bed rest with their pregnancies all the time. Or that's what I've heard. True. He was right. There were many factors in this equation. I leaned back in the chair and ran my frazzled hands through my hair. What a day. How are you feeling about the League of Witches? I opened my mouth to respond, then stopped. Um. I'm not quite sure now, to be honest. What do you mean? What's changed? I laughed at him, because how could I not? Though even I could hear the bitterness in my tone. What's changed? Are you serious? Both of my sisters are in mortal danger, and I was attacked tonight out of nowhere. Christian grinned at me. Part of the fun of being the High Warlock's daughter, right? I was just about to yell at him, when there was a loud knock at the door. I jumped to my feet and raced over to it. The great thing about living in this realm was the safety. I knew that the person on the other side of the door was welcome in the Pax realm. My father's magic was vast and all-powerful. I wrenched open the door and there stood Oliver, his dark gaze meeting my eyes with that intensity that was distinctly him. Bella, we need your help. Chapter 13 Bella I had no idea what Oliver was going to ask me, or what compelled him to reach out to me, of all people, but my response would have been the same, no matter what. Of course. Come in, come in. I ushered Oliver inside, stepping aside to make things easier. 
He was wrapped in a long wool cloak that looked particularly scratchy, and his hair was drenched as though he'd been trapped in a storm. In fact, everything about him appeared soaked. What happened? Oliver shook his wet hair around almost like a dog, and I frowned at him. I wasn't in the mood to be doused with droplets of water at the moment. More than that, my concern made it impossible to be patient with anything else. What was wrong with his magic? I gave him a long look as he continued to shake up and down. Do you want a quick dry? I asked, trying to keep the flatness from my tone. He stared at me, his lips quirking up. Yes, please. I waved my hand over him, drying him from top to bottom in a flash. Is it raining in the magical realm? I wondered out loud. Because it certainly hadn't been when I left. He nodded. It's pouring, he said, shaking his head like he couldn't quite believe it himself. His eyes looked up to the ceiling. Someone's pissed off. I glanced over at Christian, who met my gaze with a smirk. My heart grew warm without even trying. Can't imagine who, he said casually. Knowingly. Cheekily. I ignored him and waved at Oliver. Come sit down. Tell us what's going on and how we can help. We all went to the two sofas and sat, Christian and me on one, and Oliver on the other. For a moment, Oliver remained silent. Instead, he allowed himself a moment to relax into the softness the seat provided, closing his eyes and sighing in contentment. I burned with a need to ask questions, to demand some kind of response, but I was well aware I needed to control myself or else I was going to lose any ground I had gained with Oliver. Who knew what he had just gone through? I didn't want to be callous, so I gave him some time. Finally, he slowly opened his eyes and that same smirk filled with mischief littered his face. Go on then, he said, nodding in my direction. I can feel your need to ask questions from over here. You might as well ask what you need to. Before I could say anything, Oliver sneezed. My eyes widened and I exchanged a glance with Christian. Hopefully, Oliver wasn't getting sick simply because he had been drenched with rain. What did you do to piss off the council? Oliver asked, not missing the look between Christian and me. There was teasing in his tone, but there was also curiosity. I know I promised you questions, but I can't help the fact that I was deeply affected by your actions, even indirectly, and I feel as though I deserve some kind of explanation. I shrugged, ignoring the way my lips curved up in amusement at Oliver's faux seriousness. Survived a hit attempt. Oliver's eyes opened wide. Suddenly all traces of joking were gone, and he leaned forward, elbows resting on his knees. They attacked you. He asked, almost as though he wasn't sure he heard me correctly in the first place. I nodded. Yeah, magically of course, I clarified. I didn't want to make too big a deal of it. It wasn't like it had succeeded. I don't think I would have survived, but someone helped me. Fought beside me, or behind me, rather. But when I looked back, after the fight was won, they were gone. I wasn't able to see who it was. Oliver's eyes lit up, then a smile stretched his lips wide. He leaned back, hands behind his head, like this was his home and I was a guest. I had no idea how it was possible to be this smug, but apparently it was, for him. The shadow, he said knowingly. Who's the shadow? I asked. I'd never heard of such a thing. In fact, I wanted to lecture him for joking at a time like this, except his tone implied this wasn't a joke at all. Oliver grinned at me. He's a warlock, he explained. We would have asked him to join the League of Witches, but he's a shadow. Literally. No one knows what he looks like or anything about him, really, except that he's a good Samaritan. Turns up when you least expect it. Helps those in need and from what we've heard is very powerful. I nodded. He turned the tide for me, I said. Took on the two council assassins and helped me win. Like I said, I don't think the outcome would have been the same if he hadn't been there to help me. Christian reached over and squeezed my leg. Well, whoever it was, I'm grateful for the help. Speaking of help, I turned back to Oliver. You said you needed me. Oliver sighed. Yes. I believe we've started the wheels turning on a revolution 
that we never meant to start. What do you mean? I asked, my gut tightening with tension. I mean that the council has found out that we're making an alliance with you, and that's ruffled some feathers I didn't anticipate. I inhaled sharply. Is everyone okay? They hadn't hurt anyone else, had they? Oliver shook his head. No. I heard tonight that one of our powerful witch members was killed, and there have been multiple attempts on this realm. Council police trying to break in. Despite how horrible that new was, I couldn't help the flutter of pride around my heart. At least we know my father's magic is holding firm. Yes but for how long? Oliver said. Matlock is an incredible warlock, but he is also only one man. If his magic falls, so will this realm. It was built entirely on his strength. I gaped at him, the memories of my own home disappearing around us in a tornado of destruction making a shiver course down my spine. You mean, if something were to happen to my father, this realm would crumble to dust? Oliver frowned at me. Why do you say that? Have you seen it happen before? I jumped to my feet. I need to see my father. We need to do something to protect the pack and its people. The men stood too, and Christian reached for me. Not tonight, sweetheart. I think you've gone through enough today. I glanced at Oliver. What else did you come here for? He pressed his lips together, forming a thin line. I need to decide which way I'm going to lead the League into this fight, because one is coming Bella. For you. For Christian for anyone who dares to fight the council over the laws and their power. I crossed my arms over my chest. Well, I asked my father to change the marriage laws for me, and he said no. But we're going to speak to the council, about making an exception for Christian and me. I thought that might be a step in the right direction. Oliver ran a frazzled, shaking hand through his hair. That would have been. However, the council is actively trying to shut you and us down before we even get off the ground. The pack is spoiling for a fight, Christian said, out of nowhere. I don't want to speak for anyone else, but you know that if it comes down to it, we'll stand beside you, Bella. I stared at him, fear crippling me. I couldn't see Christian hurt because of me. Not again. Oliver's hand on my arm had me turning towards him. They blew up my shop, Bella. Anger surged in my belly. Hey what? Is that why your magic isn't working properly? His smile was crooked as he asked, you noticed. How could I not? But I didn't say that, I just nodded. He ran his fingers over the ring I'd made him, still sitting where he'd put it on his middle finger. Your magic saved me. I'd be dead if it wasn't for you. I stared down at the ring, the ruby now fractured in half. The stone. Yes, your blood. Your gift to me. It saved me. My jaw dropped. I. I'm so glad. I hope you'll stay here with us, Christian offered. We don't have a second room yet, but I'm pretty sure Bella could construct one in a few minutes. I stared at him. You'd let me do that? I knew Christian had always wanted to build our home himself. He nodded. Of course. I glanced over at Oliver. Will you stay? Here. For now. The warlock shifter Mix inclined his head. I would be honored. I walked over to the wall next to our bathroom and lifted my hands, imagining the space I wanted and the land behind our tiny home. Before me a door magicked out of thin air and I opened it, walking into a large space. There I built wooden floors, white walls and another small bathroom. When I was done, and the room was warm with the heat of a fire in the grate, I turned to him. King-size bed? Oliver chuckled. I'd be happy with a mattress on the floor at this point. The sadness he was hiding hit me hard and out of nowhere. Your home. Oliver's house was at the back of his shop. Was it all gone? He waved his hand. There are more important things. Like a closet. You know I need a large closet. His joke distracted me nicely. The poor man had lost everything he owned, but we could rebuild. Of course, I said, turning around and creating the most luxurious bedroom I could imagine. 
a huge four-poster bed with lush purple and gold pillows, a huge closet where I hung new cloaks, pants and shirts. When I was done, the room wasn't quite warm enough, so I added a fluffy rug at the base of the bed, and it was finished. When I turned around, Oliver and Christian were staring at me in wonder. Oliver walked forward. You are so much more powerful than you realize. He opened his arms for a hug and I rushed into them, holding him tightly. I was so sorry for everything that had happened to him, but I'd be stupid to think it was all my fault. Oliver had been fighting for the rights of those less fortunate for a long time. But it was time I fully entered the fray. I lifted my head and took a step back, meeting his dark eyes. Get some rest and in the morning, let's work out what we're going to do. Because I'm on your side, Oliver. Come hell or high water. He chuckled. There might be a bit of both. I shrugged. You may lose your place in this world, Bella. The council does not forgive. I laughed, though it was full of bitterness. I never wanted to be a part of their world, Oliver. I'm here because my father is the High Warlock, and the council forbade me to leave. Is that the only reason? Christian asked, his eyes lighting up with mischief. I grinned as I walked over to him and wrapped my arms around his waist. If I had my choice, I would build the most incredible library here and never leave. You say that, Bella, Oliver began, but you'd miss your sisters and your magic. Maybe, I whispered, not taking my eyes off Christian. But I love this world, our world. Then you need to defend it. Oliver said again. There's no going back now. They've made an attempt on your life and mine. They want us dead. Finally, I turned to look at Oliver. But they'll come for us again, won't they? He nodded, and I knew what I had to do. It was time to make the council regret coming after me. Chapter 14 After a restless night's sleep, I woke early and made breakfast for everyone. I needed something to do to occupy my time, because sitting around, thinking of all the possibilities of what might happen or might not happen, was not helping. And anyway, as tired as I was, there was no way I'd be able to get back to sleep. Instead, I focused on something I could put some time and creativity into, something that would be both delicious and thought-consuming. Waffles and fruit, whipped cream and espressos. Just the thought of it brought a smile to my face. Despite the attack yesterday, my magic felt stronger and more alive than ever before. I felt like I could take on anyone or anything, and I wanted the chance to prove myself. To fight for something worthy. The idea of battling the council would have terrified me in the past. To a degree, it still did because the logical outcome didn't quite work in my favor. But it wasn't so much the fighting part as the audacity to believe I could actually take them on because that wasn't logical. It was wishful thinking. It was hope. And that scared me, because it was so easy to be tempted by it. I didn't want to lose my head over it, and I couldn't resign myself to a life I didn't want, either. Some of this was propelled by what I had. And now, I had something and someone to fight for. That seemed to be enough for me. More than just someone. As much as Christian meant the most to me in my life, he wasn't the only person affected by this. From what Oliver had said, I had a lot of people to fight for, and who would fight with me. Because we all deserved equal rights, even those who wouldn't stand up and fight, those who hadn't yet been born. My children, my children's children. Anyone who wanted equality and fairness deserved that much. I was so busy thinking and cooking breakfast that I didn't hear anyone pad up behind me until a familiar voice spilled through the room. Good morning, Christian said as he wandered to the bathroom, then pulled on a pair of jeans and a shirt. Despite the break in conversation, he picked up right where he left off, as though he hadn't left at all. How are you feeling after yesterday? I kissed him in greeting as he stepped closer, running my hands through his thick hair. For a moment, I allowed myself the time to linger in this moment, to memorize it if I could. I knew there was a chance we'd be fighting soon and these quiet moments between us would be few and far in between. I didn't want to take that for granted. If anything, I wanted to ground myself here, so when I didn't have the opportunity, 
I could remember this and smile. Remind myself why I was fighting in the first place. He slowly pulled apart from me, and I turned my attention back to the food. In a quick snap of my fingers, I created some fresh orange juice and poured it into a glass jug. The citrusy scent bubbled up and tickled my nose. I'm really good actually, I said, though whether that was the confidence in what we were doing or the kiss we just shared, I couldn't say. Let him figure it out. It was probably the adrenaline, but considering how stressful yesterday had been, I was feeling great. Plus, the spike of the adrenaline I received from that kiss. Our new guest suite's door opened, and Oliver walked out wearing the new black clothes I'd created for him. He brushed his bejeweled fingers down his shirt front. You did a great job with the sizing, Bella. Thank you, I said, grinning at him. Come eat. The men moved to the table and ate breakfast with me, and once I'd finished my first waffle, I turned to Oliver for a plan. What do you think we should do today? Should I go to my father? Or speak to the council? Or what? I was excited to move forward with our plan, and yet I had no idea which way we needed to go. Oliver reached for his glass of orange juice and took a sip before answering. We need to speak to your father, Bella. But I'm not sure if it's safe for either of us to go out there at the moment. Is there any other way of contacting him? I bit my lip, frowning at him. I don't think so. He wanted to hide in the realm. A man who'd lived in the magical realm, helping shifters for decades. That seemed unusual. How severe had been the attack on him? Has your magic returned this morning? I didn't want to ask the question, but it seemed pertinent to the plans for the day. My, Oliver stopped to cough and clear his throat. My magic is gone. What do you mean, gone? How was that possible? He sighed, pain twinging in his face. They took out my whole shop and house. They knocked me through walls and into the ground. If it wasn't for your ring, Bella, I would never have survived. I'm alive, and that's all that matters. I frowned at him and stood, going to my potion cupboard and taking down the vials and jars. You need a healing remedy and time. Your magic isn't gone. I refused to believe it. The assassins hadn't been trying to take away his power they'd been trying to kill him. But it was possible the physical trauma had knocked his magic so low that he couldn't reach it. I twisted off leaves and added pinches of herbs. When I thought of the impact to his body, I turned around to ask, how much pain are you in? He grimaced out a smile. I'm okay. Hmm. He wasn't but he'd been hiding it well. I added in more herbs to help with his pain, then brewed it with an incantation for body and soul healing. When I turned back around with the mug, both men were staring at me. What? Oliver's lips quirked up. You've changed a lot since you arrived. Is that a bad thing? I asked, walking over to hand him the drink. He shook his head. No. Not at all. Christian reached out for my hand and tugged me to sit down again. It's a compliment, don't worry. I've always known how confident, capable, and intelligent you are. You just don't always let others see it. I wasn't sure what to say, so kept my mouth shut. Oliver sipped at my potion, grimacing occasionally at the taste. I hadn't brewed it to be sweet or flavorsome, but it would help him. And that was all that mattered. A loud knock at the door had me jumping to my feet and racing to open it. Something was wrong. On the other side of the door was Jason, Christian's best friend. Chase. What's wrong? Someone's trying to break into the realm. There are council police at the door. Shit. I turned towards Christian and Oliver, who both got to their feet. We have to do something. Please, Bella, come. Jace grabbed my arm and pulled. I went with him. Not because I had a plan, but because I needed to help. I ran up the path towards the veil, people scurrying everywhere. Women grabbed children and herded them into the houses. They were running for cover, which was smart. But if the council minions broke through, the cabins and cottages wouldn't protect the wolf shifters or their babies. There was a large group of male wolf shifters waiting by the door, 
growling and pushing each other as they fought. What's happened? I called out. They turned to me, immediately calming. I had a moment where I wanted to shrink into the ground, away from all their eyes, their expectations. But I didn't. I lifted my chin and asked again, what's happened? Nothing yet, Toby answered. He pointed through the veil, and there as clear as day, were two of the men who tried to kill me last night. Fucking bastards. I growled. They can't get through, not unless someone lets them. And even then, my father's magic should keep them out. The ground trembled as one of the warlocks landed a solid blow to the veil, repeatedly striking at the invisible door with his magic. I walked over to the space about three feet wide and seven feet tall. Anger surged inside me, just as it had last night. I pressed my hands to the veil though fear shot through me. Please don't open, I begged the door. Grow stronger. Thicker. Don't let them in. I infused my thoughts with magic, passing the incantation through my mind and my hands, and white light filled the space. The assassins took a few steps back and stopped firing at us. I hadn't created this world, and in the past, I'd found my magic was quite limited in this space. But not at this moment. At this moment, I felt in tune with my father's magic, the two synergies humming along together. I stepped back and glared through the door for good measure, though I was pretty sure they couldn't see me. They can't get through, but they're here for a reason. They want in. Or maybe they want you out, Tad said, a guy to my left who had never liked me. I crossed my arms over my chest and turned towards him. That's possible. Christian stepped closer to me. What do you think we should do? Do you think they're here for you or Oliver? Or someone else? There was no one else in the pack of consequence to the council. Not that I knew of, anyway. Oliver stepped up to the veil, examined it, then turned around and addressed the rest of the men, go home. Eat your breakfast. If this turns into a battle, you're going to need your strength. No one argued with him. Instead, they muttered a bit under their breath, then turned and walked away. I sighed and pinched the bridge of my nose, where a headache was building behind my eyes. What is the council doing? Oliver groaned. I don't know, but it's clear that they're actively trying to take us out. A thought occurred to me, and I looked up. What about the rest of the League? Should we contact them? Bring them into the Shifter realm? Oliver glanced at Christian, then back at me. We should. But I don't want to risk anything happening to you or anyone else who goes out there now. But they're attacking our people. I argued. They're going to kill more witches and warlocks and anyone else who stands up against them. We need to stop them. They're the council. Christian said with a sadness in his voice I'd never heard before. There is no stopping them. He shuddered, and I glared at him. Oh yes there is. My sister stopped them. Tavlor stopped them. They would have killed my sister if they hadn't been stopped. Oliver and Christian exchanged looks once more, and it only made me angrier. I wanted to stomp my foot, but tried hard not to look juvenile. Stop having some silent shifter conversation. I'm right here. If you want to say something to me, then say it." Christian sighed and ran a hand through his hair. Bella, we're outnumbered, outpowered and to be honest, not in a position to fight the council and win. So we're going to stay in here for, what? Forever. Locked in a prison of our own making, until they find a way through my father's magic and get in. I wouldn't have it. I wouldn't. No. I shook my head, heat flushing up my cheeks as my anger grew. I will not hide any longer. And I will not just sit around and wait for them to kill me and those I love. If they counsel wants a fight, then I'm up for the challenge. Chapter 15 The council had wanted me either dead or playing for their side since the moment they found out about my existence. That much I knew. That wasn't so difficult to figure out. Thanks to the fact that I'd been attacked and almost killed, they'd backed off and hadn't pushed the fact that as a child of the High Warlock, I should be in a seat of power. But maybe it was time for me to step into that role. Push back against those things that I opposed. 
it would be a way I could potentially fight against injustice. It gave me power I knew I needed to accomplish what I wanted done. I spent the day in meetings with the PAC leaders, then some of the women and older teens. I needed to know where everyone stood. I wanted to accumulate as much data as I could in order to understand the perception different people had not only about this issue, but about any other issues I might not even recognize because of my ignorance. I might have grown up in a protective realm thanks to my mother, but I couldn't shy away from the privilege I had been born into with my father being who he was. And because of that, it was easy to see things from a perspective that discounted other things. I wanted to make sure I knew what other issues were and what the people actually wanted without making assumptions. Not surprisingly, the whole pack wanted to fight, even though they knew that if it came to a warlock versus wolf battle, they'd lose. As powerful as they were physically, they were no match for magic. That was a fact, not a hopeless cry of frustration. But it was a problem, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was one I might be able to solve. What if I could make them something to help shield them from magic? I asked Oliver, as we were making lunch together. I had been thinking about this for a while, especially after those two men who attacked me had thrown a lightning bolt of magic at my face. If I didn't have my shield, I'd be dead right now. It had saved my life. If I could some conjure up a bunch of those for every wolf who fought, maybe they'd have more of a chance. Like a pendant or something they could wear? he asked, glancing over at me as his hands continued to work. I nodded, cutting up the cheese and buttering rolls. Yeah, why not? It's just not fair that the shifters are so disadvantaged. If they could just hold their own with a warlock, they could win. Physically, they're much stronger. And their bodies could hold out. It's just they're better at a close range, whereas the warlocks won't let them get close. Not with the way their magic works. If they keep the shifters at bay, there's no way they'll be able to get close enough to use their power against the warlocks, and there's no way the warlocks would ever let them get that close. Maybe if they had a pendant that would shield them, they might be able to do it. Oliver chuckled while he made exotic-looking drinks. Yeah, a warlock wouldn't physically stand a chance against a wolf shifter in full flight, he agreed. He'd take the warlock's head off with two bites. And just like that, a plan was formed. I nearly got butter all over my fingers in my excitement. I couldn't focus on anything else and needed to distract myself before I stabbed one of the rolls accidentally. Can you finish lunch for me? I asked, wiping the butter from my hands with a towel and shoving them under the faucet. It was difficult to think of anything else now that I was starting to make progress. I have to find a spell that will let me do that. Oliver nodded still grinning like he was amused by my antics, and I raced over to my bookshelf, taking down some of my favorite books and placing them on the round dining table. I still had a few of my mother's ancient spell books, so I started with those. I figured the sort of magic I wanted to use would have been created in ancient times, especially since it was a protective spell. I could be wrong, but I had to start somewhere. I opened the text and began to skim the words, chewing on my bottom lip. I thought I would be sitting there for hours, but within minutes I found exactly what I was after. Yes. This is perfect. What have you found? Oliver asked, finishing up our simple lunch. He was casual with his question, not bothering to rush in the way I might have. Something to help even the fight. Look. I pulled the book over to the side so Oliver could see. He strolled over to where I sat and glanced forward some of his hair falling into his face. From what I'm gathering, this will give the wolves some protection against magic. It might actually work. It took everything in me not to say it with more certainty. I couldn't be positive, and I didn't want to get my hope up. Or Oliver's. He nodded. It will. It'll elevate the wolves' ability to withstand certain spells, but it won't save them if a warlock truly comes after them with a death spell. Hum. I pressed my lips together, thinking hard. Then I might need to add something myself. I glanced up at him, noting the paleness in his cheeks. How are you feeling? Oliver flicked back his long dark hair and smiled at me. Perfectly well, 
though I could use another one of your disgusting healing potions. I can feel my strength returning this morning. Really? Of course. I rush to the kitchen to make him another remedy. We might need you if it comes to war. The wolves will need shielding, and maybe that is the answer. With enough warlocks and witches on our side, maybe we can shield the wolves enough to be able to attack. I pinched the leaves of a saffron plant and threw together the brew for Oliver. When it was finished I turned around and his face gave me pause. What's wrong? His nose was wrinkled and one eyebrow was raised. This looks and smells different. I just handed it to him and said, drink it. You need it. I couldn't explain why or how I knew that but I did. He stared at me, a twinkle of silver magic flashing in his dark eyes. You're very intuitive about your spells and your magic. Is that entirely you, or did your mother have it as well? I chuckled. My mother was all about emotion with spells, so I suppose I might have gotten some of that from her. However, I wasn't sure how intuitive her spells were. She'd never talked about it. Oliver took a sip and grimaced. Tastes almost worse than the first one. Good, I said, going back to my books. I'm gonna see if I can find something better. In the end, I couldn't. I could impregnate the equalizer spell into jewelry that could be hung around a wolf shifter's neck, so if they were human or wolf, it would remain. What I liked about it was that the spell remained neutral unless the wearer was attacked. When that happened, it became both a mirror and a shield taking some of the power from the attacker and projecting it back on them. With the council gunning for Oliver and me, anyone who stood on our side needed protection. Where's Christian? I asked. He's with the Wolf Council. The elders are discussing the brewing war. I glanced up from my book. I need about twenty necklaces, leather with a hanging stone. Do you know where I could get some? I could magically make them of course, but the spell would hold so much better if the stones had been made organically. Strangely enough, I do know someone in the pack that could make those for you. Oliver tipped back his head and swallowed the rest of the potion, then picked up the sandwich he'd made. I think I'll go now. The faster we jump on this, the better. True. Oliver headed out and I picked up a sandwich as well, chomping on the crunchy salad and fresh bread. When the door opened again, it was Christian. His eyes were alight and his face was flushed red with exertion or cold, I wasn't sure. Lunch? I asked, gesturing to the sandwiches. Christian nodded and scooped some up, chomping down. Thanks. You look excited somehow, I said, surprised by this shift in attitude. This morning he'd been quite worried about what I had in mind and what the council would do if we stood up against them. He shrugged. Yeah, I am, in a way. The wolf elders want us to form a party. A protection detail, so to speak. They don't want to just sit around and wait for the council to break in here and kill us all, they want us to go on the offensive. I stood up, my heart banging in my chest. They want to create a... What did I even call it? He nodded. Yep. So, when you're ready to go find your dad or whatever, we'll go with you. I swallowed hard, the reality of what I was setting up coming home to tighten my throat. I don't want anyone to get hurt, Christian. He leaned forward and kissed me on the lips, and it felt like forever since I'd felt his heat against me. Oliver said you were making something to help us. I nodded and explained about the necklaces. Christian had another sandwich, then sighed. So when should we leave? I picked up my spell book and headed towards the door. As soon as I get everything organized. Let's go find Oliver. Luckily, when I opened the door, Oliver was heading back to the cottage with a girl about my age by his side. In her hands were many, many primitive looking necklaces. Something like this. Oliver asked with a flourish of his hand towards the girl. I grinned at him. Definitely. Please come in. Oliver and the young blonde came inside and placed the piles of jewelry on the table. Um, Oliver said this could help. I make necklaces and bracelets. For fun. For. The girl was nervous, and I appreciated that. 
they're fantastic. Thank you, I said, glancing up at Oliver. Can I buy them? Pay you. Oh no no, she said, shaking her hands at me. A gift then. I said, practically chasing her to the door. Please let me thank you. No. Please. You're doing so much for our pack. I. I glanced towards Christian who shrugged. He wouldn't know what a young woman would want. You said you like making jewelry as a hobby. I asked, pulling at my magic and creating a bar of gold and holding it out to her. How about some gold? Do you have a smelter? A way to mold it. The girl's eyes widened in awe. I yes. I could but. Take it. I thrust the gold at her. And thank you so much. The girl trembled with the gold in her hands. But I. Take it, Oliver said from behind me. It cost Bella nothing to make it for you, so don't worry about the price. The girl gave me a final smile and ran out. I turned back to what I really wanted, handmade, real stones. I ran my fingers over the necklaces, enjoying the softness of the leather and the different shapes of the stones. These are great, Oliver. Thanks. He clapped his hand on my shoulder. Do your thing. I wriggled my fingers and brought the book closer. Thank you. I moved the necklaces around on the table so that each of the stones were obvious and I could distribute the magic over every piece. I lifted my hands and began the incantation. It was a rather simple spell, but long and required more of my power than I expected. White light filtered from my hands over the jewelry and made it glow. When I'd repeated the spell twenty times, all the strength drained from me. I could barely lift my arms. Whoa! I staggered sideways and grabbed a dining table chair before collapsing into it. This realm seriously sucks the life out of me. Which told me one thing. If we were going to fight the council, we either had to draw them in here where their magic would be impaired, or hope that my spells worked to protect them out there. Oliver picked up one of the necklaces, and examined the glowing white stone. Impressive, Bella. Thanks, I huffed, taking long deep breaths. I wonder if they work. Christian chose one of the necklaces with a large dark stone, and placed it around his neck. Why don't you try it? Throw some magic at me and see what happens. I shook my head. I don't think I've got anything left. Let me try, Oliver said, cracking his knuckles in a theatrical way. I've got a little juice in the tank. I think. Try it. I gestured between the two men. I had no idea what was going to happen. If my magic created what I'd aimed for with the necklace, or if my potions had helped Oliver enough. But either way, he was going to try. Oliver conjured a white ball of light in his right palm, a grin stretching across his face at the accomplishment. Without warning, he fired it at Christian, hitting him square in the chest. Christian took a step back, shook himself like he was brushing off some dust, then stood straight once more. Barely felt a thing. Oliver's grin said it all. I put a lot of heat into that. Bella. You're a genius. For the first time in centuries, the shifters have a chance at fighting back. Chapter 16 The necklaces were a hit among the Wolf Council and the pack. The strongest of their men and women took a piece of jewelry each and proudly displayed it for all to see. I beamed when I saw them adorning the necks of those I cared about. Though I couldn't feel the protection magic laced in the material, I knew it was there, and that alone meant everything to me. The fact that they wore them, knowing the significance of what each jewel meant, was enough for me to realize that everything I was fighting for was coming to fruition. We might, we might have a chance. I sucked in a breath and held it, trying not to let the hope bubble up inside of me for too long. The last thing I needed, was to disappoint not only myself but everyone here. Everyone who believed in me. They're ready to fight for you, Oliver whispered into my ear as we stood in the clearing watching the wolves showing off their new magical shields. I swallowed. I knew that already, but the fact that he said it was enough to cause every muscle inside of me to freeze, just for a moment. 
the reassurance, the way he said it with such insistence, to make me understand just how significant this was. I turned to look up at him. I don't want them to fight for me, I said slowly. I'm the one that wants to fight for them, for their rights. They're your rights too, Oliver reminded me, giving me a playful wink that was somehow serious at the same time. You soon to be husbands. You're perhaps one day children. Don't forget how important you are as well, Bella. I sighed heavily and went back to staring at the pack. My cheeks pinched with a blush I hadn't expected, but I tried not to think about that. I didn't want to think about my future. There were too many questions, at least right now. Maybe later, after all of this, when I would actually have time to think. I patted my stomach in a subtle way, trying to imagine growing heavy with Christian's child. For the longest time, it was all I ever wanted, until I found out that having his child might not even be possible. I wasn't sure I could handle such terrible disappointment, even if we fought and won. Instantly, I bristled. Selfish. That was selfish of me. It shouldn't matter whether I could have children or not in the first place. The only thing that mattered was being able to acquire equal rights for those who deserved them. Everything else would find a way. I could worry about it all later. You're right, I forced myself to say, dropping my hand back down to my side. It's just that I hate the idea of any of them getting hurt because I've decided to stand up to the council. I don't want it to be about me, if that makes sense. I want them to look at this like this is their fight, their opportunity, to stand up for what they want. People get hurt in wars, Oliver mused, his lips pinching at the sides as though remembering a certain person who he'd lost. But the rights you're fighting for extend well past marriage and will be a wonderful thing to see. He paused. I don't know much about wolf shifters, but I'm sure they understand that particular loss better than anyone. And they would rather die fighting than remain alive, continuing to be treated like little more than dirt under a boot. They're not cowards. They just needed a reminder that they're just as important. It's easy to forget after years and years of being treated as less than. But you gave them that spark to remember, and that's important. That spark is worth fighting for. I couldn't stop myself from chuckling. It'll put you out of business a bit though, won't it? I teased, though I could feel my cheeks turn red at the thought. When I met Christian, he was coming to you to buy a wolf shifter hiding potion. When I turned to look at him again, Oliver was grinning. Well, yes. But I can make money another way. That's never been much of a concern for me. I had so many questions about Oliver and his life. Did he have a partner hidden somewhere? But I knew that now was not the time to ask. I needed to focus on the task at hand, and right now, that meant getting everything ready. We should rally the troops, so to speak, Oliver said with a small smile, his fingers touching his lips. They look ready to fight, but they need direction. Yes, I said, taking the moment to look around once more. I agree. Great, Oliver gave me a small nudge. So go on then. Make a speech I know your family is so good at making. Inspire them, Bella. My eyes widened. What? I practically screeched. You can't be serious. I'm not the sort who. Bella. Oliver took another step towards me, perking his brows. He rested his hands on my shoulders and gave them a gentle squeeze. They're here because of you. Don't forget that. You inspire them. I. You don't have to feel inspirational, he said, but that doesn't take away from the fact that you are. Don't forget that. He patted my shoulders. Now come on. Rally the troops and all that. He winked again. I wanted to argue with him. I was ready to do just that, but then my eyes caught sight of a couple with their child, how the child was playing with his father's necklace and smiling. How the mother's eyes were a touch of sadness, but also just as prideful as the rest. She didn't want to leave her child, I realized. But this was too important not to do something. And if she could do something as difficult and as heartbreaking as leave her child knowing there was a chance she might not make it back, what was my excuse to not give a little speech? I cleared my throat. Um, excuse me, I said, lifting my voice slightly. 
Oliver pressed his lips together, clearly amused by everything but somehow managing to contain his laughter. My cheeks burned even more and I shifted my weight. Ah, excuse me. This time I was a little louder, managing to catch the attention of some of the wolves nearby. But it wasn't everyone. Try this, Oliver whispered. He flicked his fingers without even speaking an incantation and pointed to my neck. What did you? I immediately cut myself off because my voice boomed through the area and I knew at this point I was as red as the tomatoes in my garden. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Actually, ah, uh, I just wanted your attention for a moment. I'm glad to see everyone wearing their protective jewelry. I hope you understand the significance of what they are and what they mean. I had no idea where I was going with this speech, but as the words came out, they felt more and more natural. I didn't have to shout, thanks to Oliver's spell that somehow increased the sound of my voice, and surprisingly enough, every wolf turned to look at me. I had their attention. You're fighters, I said slowly. More than that, you're believers. You believe you're more than what they say you are. And you're willing to fight for those beliefs. The wolves got quiet. I could hear the subtle sound of the buzzing bees from a distance. My arms got chills. I could hear my own heart beating against my chest, and I couldn't help but wonder if they could hear it too. I opened my mouth, ready to continue, when a glimmer caught my eye. The veil shimmered and suddenly, witches and warlocks came through. The wolves tensed. Some shifted into their wolf form while others growled a warning. Suddenly, they stopped and put up their hands. We're here to fight with you, one of the warlocks said. We believe in your cause, a witch said, stepping forward. We want to end the inequality. The wolves shifted with unease. Disbelief married their features. All of them turned to me like I was going to make the difference about what was the right decision and what wasn't. I wanted to hold up my hands and tell them they could make that call. But they looked to me for the answer. It suddenly struck me that the wolves looked at me like I was their leader. Someone they'd follow into battle without hesitation. That was a huge responsibility. I wasn't sure I deserved their faith, but I knew I couldn't take it for granted. If you want to fight with us, we welcome you, I said, stepping forward. I ask that you take care and emphasize blocking with your shields. Each wolf has a necklace that will offer some protection, but having you here will help even more. My voice wavered. I'm not going to promise this will be easy. It won't be. In fact, if enough of them gather against us, there's a good chance we're going to lose. A beat. My cheeks flushed. I needed to catch my breath but I didn't want to lose momentum. The council won't stop killing. We know that. What we need to figure out is what to do about it. We can wait. I'm positive they're going to come for us. They hate that this is what we want. That we're willing to openly defy their tradition. They'll do everything they can to silence us, and with the death they've already dealt us, they have no problem doing it again and again. But we won't stop. We can't. Not now. Not when we've sacrificed too much. Well, I for one am tired of having to sacrifice my life, my wants, my feelings, for people who don't care about me. Some of the wolves howled. It only spurred me on even more. So I said. I leave it to you. Do we wait where we can fight on familiar territory? Or do we go through the veil and take out the council ourselves? I wanted to say so much more, but I couldn't. It needed to come from them. This was a decision they had to make. I'm tired of waiting, a wolf in the back said. Me too. Let's do this. Cheers, shouts, and howls all echoed their decision. To the veil. I hollered, and we marched to the destination of our impending battle. Chapter 17 We were almost at the veil. My heart tripped against my chest. I wasn't sure what would happen when we reached it. There was no way of knowing if we could enter freely, or if the council somehow knew what we were up to, and had guards positioned on the other side, waiting to take advantage of us, when we weren't expecting it. 
As the person leading the charge, the responsibility of what to do was mine and mine alone. Did I continue through? Did I have much of a choice at this point? I wished I had a book with all the answers. But I didn't. I would have to figure this out based on instinct. At that moment, someone appeared. I tilted my chin down, gathering my magic just in case I needed to use it. I wasn't expecting a fight here, but if it came to that, I would do what needed to be done, as would the wolves. Except, it wasn't a threat. It was my father. What was he doing here? He made his way towards me, hurrying as much as his robes would allow. I had no idea how he did it but somehow, he was able to move in a way that was both hurried and regal at the same time. Is that? I nodded at Oliver's almost unasked question. Keep the wolves at bay for a moment while I see what's going on, I said. If you don't mind. I didn't wait for Oliver to respond. Instead, I moved to my father. We met in the middle, still a few feet away from the veil. Father. Bella, he exclaimed, reaching out to grab my shoulders. His head dropped, scanning my person before reaching my eyes once again. Are you hurt? I furrowed my brows. Hurt. I repeated, before shaking my head. No. I, what do you mean? My father released my shoulders once he was satisfied that I was unharmed, and stood up to his full height. The council knows Bella, he said slowly, keeping his voice low. He knew the wolves had amazing hearing, so it seemed like he wanted to keep this news between the two of us. What's worse is that they're after you. What? I felt like an idiot. I understood the words my father used, but it was like they didn't register. The council, Bella, my father said, an edge to his voice. They're after you. I thought, he cut himself off, not willing to finish his thought. Anyway. Bella, are you sure you want to go through with this? The council isn't something to trifle with. Perhaps if you stop. I can't stop, father, I interrupted, surprised he would even ask me such a thing. This is bigger than you and me and any individual here. We have to fight for this. If not, who else will? The risk. I understand the risk, I interrupted. I'm not sure you do, my father murmured. Bella, they want you dead. Anyone willing to fight, they'll put down. This whole battle is a threat to everything they stand for, everything they believe in. And if you're going to go through with this, you must understand there's a good chance that people may. I waited. I needed my father to finish that sentence. I was sick and tired of people dancing around their words to try and make me feel at ease. I wanted him to deliver the truth to me. I was tired of having him sugarcoat things to make me feel better. When he remained silent, I lifted my brows, hoping to emphasize my point. My father cleared his throat. I expected he would look away, but he did me the courtesy of hanging on to eye contact. Die, he finished. I understand. I said slowly because I did. I do understand, father. If I wasn't ready to die for what I believed in, I wouldn't be here. But I'm here. I'm ready. Bella, you can't. I can and I will, I interjected. Each time I said something my voice grew stronger, and I realized I believed in myself enough, in the wolves and everybody who chose to fight with us, more than I thought I did. This is bigger than just me wanting a wedding even though it is that. Ava can't fight because of her pregnancy, and I wouldn't want her to. We're here because this is right. This is important. I looked at him for a moment. It's okay if you can't, you know. I know as High Warlock, you might not be allowed. You think I'd allow my daughter to fight without me, he asked. I don't know what you can and can't do, I said, lifting a shoulder. I would never assume. But if you can't, I just want you to know that it's okay. I understand. My father gave me a long look. He reached out and cupped my cheek in his hand, his eyes glittering. I'm so very proud of you, Bella, he murmured in a soft voice. Forgive me for not telling you enough. I opened my mouth, ready to tell him that it was okay, that there was nothing to forgive, when cries caught my attention. I turned to look at where people diverted their attention. 
I froze. The council police had made their way through the veil. At first, I thought it was just a handful. We could handle that many without an issue. But then more continued to come, and they wouldn't stop coming. Their black uniforms glittered under the setting sun, and all had trickles of magic dancing on their fingertips like weapons poised and ready. Their gazes never left us, and they didn't look intimidated in the slightest. I knew the wolves were looking at me to see how I would react. I knew I needed to be a strong leader or else they would falter and would question what they were doing. I was just glad that at the very least they had those necklaces. I just hoped the council police didn't have the magic to penetrate through them. Activate your protection spells, I calmly told the wolves. I wasn't sure if they all heard me despite their powerful hearing, but I could hear the soft humming as a ripple of protection spells flared to life. I waited, never taking my eyes off the council police. They continued to remain there, frozen with that same impassive look on their faces as they took us in. Without warning, the one in the middle lifted a hand and shot a lightning bolt of magic at the nearest wolf. I didn't recognize who he might have hit, but in that instant, the wolf's shield broke because of the magic. It struck him in the chest, causing him to drop to his knees. He opened his mouth, maybe to breathe, to speak, but blood trickled down his chin. His eyes rolled to the back of his head and he collapsed forward, dead. My eyes widened. I was ready to storm through there, to fight immediately. Something surged through my body, an unfamiliar feeling that caused ripple after ripple to travel down my spine. Stop this farce at once or you will die, the man said, the one who'd killed the wolf. He didn't seem perturbed in the least that he had killed someone. Hell, I didn't think he cared. How he was able to set aside his feelings on the matter, if he had feelings for them at all, amazed me. I didn't think I would have that same ability, even if I had to kill in order to save my own life. We will only stop once the council has decreed wolves and those magically inclined are free to marry whom they love, I announced, my face contorting into a vicious scowl as my hands trembled. Though whether it was due to the anger I felt or whatever was going on inside me, I didn't have a clue. Then you're asking for death. And you're asking for war. The man smiled for the first time since he arrived. So be it, he said. But no, it's a war you cannot possibly win. If all these wolves have those pathetic shields, we will cut them down and kill every last one of you. Marriage won't be so easy if you're dead. And even if we all die, I said slowly, they will read about this battle in books. The legacies will carry this battle in their blood. And someone will change these laws because they're wrong. Maybe we lose. Maybe you're right and we all die. But eventually, we will take what is rightfully ours. We will be equal with you. That is inevitable. The man snorted and lifted his hand once more. This time, I knew what to expect and shot out my fingers. Magic sparkled in a way I hadn't noticed before as my shield covered the wolves at the front lines, causing the spell the man cast to bounce off it harmlessly. I released a breath I didn't realize I had been holding. However, I also knew I needed to do something, something more, because I couldn't protect everyone with my magic. As much as I wanted to, it was impossible. A loud whine pierced the air, and I whirled around, only to find one of the wolves sinking to his knees. There was something familiar about him, though I couldn't say how I knew him or from where. I hadn't spoken to him. And then it hit me. It was the wolf, the couple, that had left their child behind. The father was on his knees. His eyes were glassy, staring straight ahead at what appeared like nothing before he fell forward. I didn't have to check on him, to know for sure that he was dead. He was. My heart lurched. I should have expected this. We were at war, after all. I had just delivered a speech that reminded everyone who chose to fight, that there was always a chance they would have to endure death. And yet. Seeing it with my own eyes was too much. I wasn't sure how to respond. Tears pricked my eyes but this was not the time to cry. I needed to focus on the task at hand. More than that, I needed. I needed to do something. But what? A wolf leapt over me and tackled a woman wearing a black robe to the ground. She landed hard. 
Before she could emit a sound, the wolf lunged for her neck, tearing at the skin and pulling out her jugular. My stomach twisted into knots. As much as I loathed the witches and warlocks fighting to oppress us, I didn't want to see the violence. I didn't want to see the pain, pain that didn't need to exist if only the traditionally minded would be open enough to let us love whomever we liked. Why did it have to come to this? I clenched my teeth together as anger moved through my system. It didn't make any logical sense to me. I didn't understand why we couldn't have what we were asking for. This wouldn't hurt anyone. We were simply fighting for love. But for them, for some reason, that was too much. A flash of gold caught my peripheral vision, and a group of wolves collapsed next to me, including one that couldn't have been more than fifteen. All of them were dead. I wasn't sure what happened to their protective charm. Perhaps the magic the warlock used managed to penetrate through it, but it didn't matter. The wolves were being taken out. And even though we managed to hit some of their fighters, the numbers weren't going to be in our favor. They already weren't. I had to do something, dot but what? Something struck me, and for a moment I was sure I had been hit. But no. It came from inside me. Something warm. Something overpowering that continued to trickle across my skin, like tiny bolts of electricity. And I knew what it was. I knew. Power. It was my power. It was something I could do. Now, I just had to get it to work for me. Chapter 18 The power was building inside of me. I could feel it rising like a storm. Around me, people were dying. I couldn't allow this to continue to happen. Not if there was something inside of me that had the ability to stop it. The wolf shifters snarled and clashed with the warlocks fighting for their lives, their homes, their rights, their children. A burning sensation filled my veins. I felt my magic surge through me like powering up a machine. I was fighting for Christian, for everything we'd worked so hard for. For our right to marry, to have children. For our children's rights to marry whomever they loved, even if that clashed with the council's traditional values. I was fighting for the wolves, who all deserve the same equal rights I had, who shouldn't have to risk their lives, all because they wanted to love and marry someone that challenged the status quo. What was the council fighting for? To stay in power. To remain the oppressors of these people. To dictate what marriage could look like. It was ridiculous, and honestly, it was a joke. They had nothing personal in this. How could a marriage between two people hurt them at all? Where was the danger in love? That was what made no rational sense to me. That was what I didn't fathom, no matter how many times I tried to understand things from their perspective. The warlocks that were on our side were shielding the shifters the best they could, but as I watched another witch get taken out by a warlock, my blood boiled. The protective necklaces were doing a good job, but I didn't realize the extent of the magic the council police had. And one look at our opponents, and it was clear their facial expressions hadn't changed whatsoever, as though they were completely unaffected by this fight. Some weren't even breaking a sweat. How dare they? Like how fucking dare they? They didn't care that they were taking out not only the wolves, but other witches, other warlocks, others just like them. All they cared about was remaining in control and refusing to allow others to question what they deemed was right. And if they had to kill in order to do just that, so be it. I walked across the battlefield, shielding myself and anyone within a ten-foot radius. I had worried my magic would weaken the longer I was out here fighting, but it hadn't. It tingled against my skin like static electricity, reminding me I could use it at any time. Spells hit me from the council side of the battle, denting and cracking my shield over and over, prickling with heat and death. If I didn't have a shield, if I didn't have that magic, I'd be dead too. But I did. The spells didn't brush close. Nowhere near it. In fact, I didn't even blink as another one bounced off the shield on my left, a pathetic shot that meant nothing in the grand scheme of things. I needed to end this. And with this new power, I was certain I could. It was strange, 
I believed more than anything in the intelligence I possessed and in the intricacy of the magic I knew how to use. It had never seemed possible I would be the winner in a battle against powerful warlocks and witches. I didn't think such a thing was possible, because physical exertion wasn't my strength. But here I was. I had the wolves to thank for that. Wolves ready to die for this cause. Wolves ready to sacrifice everything just for the chance of obtaining the same rights as everyone else. And Christian. Christian gave me a reason to fight, a reason to believe in myself. My eyes swept the landscape for him, my heart skipping a beat. I needed to find him, needed to make sure. And there he was. Christian was in wolf form, standing over one of his fallen comrades protecting him. I took a step towards him, when a prickle of premonition caressed my neck. I glanced over towards the council and saw an old man throw a knife towards Christian. I cried out and threw magic in his direction. The knife tilted off course, missing his chest but landing solidly in his left leg. He whined in pain then stumbled to the ground. I whipped out both hands and faced them. My enemy. Bella. My father's voice reached me but I couldn't see him. His hand landed on my shoulder. Use my magic. Hit them once. Hit them hard. I didn't understand his words or how to do as he asked. But despite that, magic poured through me as I siphoned off my father's abilities. I brought my hands together, white lightning crackling between my fingertips. The magic grew expansive until I could feel it inside of me. Angry, hurt and powerful. I stretched it out wide, flat and huge like a shield stretching across the entire battlefield. My father fell away. Was he okay? I wasn't sure, but I couldn't look back. I gathered all my power, calling on my father's bloodline and all the love I had in my heart for my family. I leaned forward and let loose. A scream that had been building in my throat burst forward as I brought my arms together, like the flapping of gigantic wings. The wave of magic plowed towards the group of the council and their police, hitting them all at once. Some of them were knocked off their feet, landing flat on their backs. Others simply crumpled to the ground. I fell to my knees, exhausted. Good girl, Dad said from behind me, where he lay depleted. I crawled over to where Christian lay over his friend, blood pouring from his wound. I reached for the knife, wrapped my fingers around the hilt and pulled it out. Fast. Christian immediately let go of his wolf and shifted back to human. Blood poured down his now human arm. Fuck that hurts. I wasn't sure how much power I had left, but I reached over and put everything I had into a healing spell. The flesh slowly knitted together, and when there was no more bleeding, I groaned and let my head fall. Christian jumped up and gathered me in his arms. Bella, are you okay? What should we do next? Did you kill them? I tried to stand on my own, but ended up sagging against Christian's chest. No. They're just unconscious, I think. Greg. Kale. Round up the pack and go get the council. They're all knocked out, not dead. Tie them up. Drag them back here to stand trial. I patted his chest. That's a good idea. My eyes were closing. I had nothing left. I sagged against my man and let him carry me. I floated in and out of consciousness as the action ebbed and flowed around me. People were shouting and whispering as well, but I couldn't summon the energy to respond. I woke in my own bed, with my father sitting beside me. Hey. He glanced up from the book he'd been reading. You're awake. Thank the gods. I was beginning to worry about you. I pushed up to a seated position. What happened? The wolves arrested the council. He smirked a little, and I couldn't stop my answering smile. They are going to be very angry when they wake up. It was hours later when the council awoke, and more to get them ready to stand trial. Some still had remnants of the battle upon their features. Good. They deserved much worse. In fact, I was surprised that some had survived at all. I still wasn't quite sure what this magic inside me was, but it was difficult to control. If anything, it scared me more than I was willing to admit. 
not that I would ever admit to it in the first place. After all this, I would do research so I could see for myself what the magic meant, where it came from, and what I needed to do with it in order to control it. I stayed perfectly still in the rickety seat I was given at the old courthouse in the wolf realm. It wasn't a large building, and there were places here that desperately needed upkeep. But I didn't care, and I didn't think anyone else did either. The only thing that mattered was forcing them to stand trial, and forcing them to change the laws in the wolf realm. The last part was something Oliver strongly suggested, like pouring salt in their wounds, and I couldn't help but agree wholeheartedly with the plan. This was significant, where this new piece of our history took place, and knowing the council would be forced to overturn tradition in a small, cramped courthouse in a completely different realm was perfect. The room itself could probably fit a hundred people, maybe two hundred at most, and it was packed. There was standing room only, and even then, the audience was pushed together like sardines. I was seated in the bench area, and there were twelve people sitting in the jury box. Ava and Taylor sat on one side of me while Christian sat on my left. Courtney sat on the other side of him, and then Oliver rounded out the end. All of us were silent. All of us were waiting. Suddenly, a small door opened, and a wolf wearing a tan sheriff uniform came in. Please rise for the Honorable Judge Rafe Harding. Everyone stood as the judge walked in. He had a scar that ran down the left side of his face, and his silver hair was disheveled, but other than that, he looked pristine in the robes he wore. He climbed to his seat and sat down before banging the gavel once. And what's on the docket today? he asked. As if he didn't know. Your Honor, I'm here to require the remaining council members to install a new law that would equalize both shifter and witch or warlock, my father said. He had been sitting at the other table next to the row of council captives. It will be enacted both here, in the shifter realm as well as in the magic realm. The law itself would allow those in love to marry whomever they wanted, despite the species they come from. Without warning, Christian took my hand in his and gave it a small squeeze. I looked over at him, and suddenly I was struck with the fact that no matter what happened to us, no matter what we would have to endure, everything was going to be okay. We were going to make this work for us. Present your argument to the court, the judge commanded my father, gesturing at him with his arm. Your Honor, love knows no bounds, the High Warlock stated. We are often told to follow our hearts, and then condemned when we do so, and it doesn't live up to society's tolerance of what it believes love is. The marriage laws were enacted centuries ago to keep bloodlines pure. In fact, some of the oldest wizarding families participated in incestual marriage simply to ensure their magic was the only blood passed down from generation to generation, and that has been overturned because of the problematic nature of marrying your brother or cousin or whomever. If such tradition can modernize based on new research, we can surely allow more alterations to occur as our society grows. This isn't to say we must condemn our past. The law itself was created for the good of the magical realm, to promote strong ties, and to increase a family's power. And those aren't bad on their own. Only when such power is paired with bigotry do we have a problem, and that is what I'm here to change. It will never work, one of the council members said. This will bring the magical community to its knees. You will make us weak by diluting our blood with, with animals. An outraged murmur rippled across the small courtroom. The judge had to bang his gavel in hopes corralling everyone to order. My father wasn't perturbed in the slightest, however. He waited patiently until it was quiet again, before continuing. Those who are opposed to such marriages won't be forced to participate in them, he said. We don't wish to take power away from the magic realm, we hope to elevate the status of wolves as equals by giving them the same rights we have. Ultimately, that right comes down to choice. More specifically, the choice of whom someone marries. We ask your honor, that the council abolish the interspecies marriage laws prohibiting a wolf and a witch or warlock from marrying. We think it's the right thing for both realms to unite, should they wish, and progress into our modern day and age. And we, the same warlock from before said, standing up and banging his fist on the table, will do no such thing. This is a farce, an abomination. 
the children produced from such a marriage will be burdens. They'll be. Order, the judge snapped. Considering you have already vocalized your dissent through the murders you committed, I order you to refrain from speaking. He set his gavel back down. I've thought carefully about this, and I'm inclined to agree with the high warlock. As of today, at 3.33 in the afternoon, this court finds the interspecies laws to be hereby abolished. And the council sitting before me is ordered to abolish those laws in their realm, or risk being imprisoned for the rest of his or her life in a cell created by the magic realm for wolves, with a wolf cellmate. He banged his gavel for the last time. Without warning, Christian pulled me to him and claimed my lips with his own. You're brilliant, he said, resting his forehead against mine. This time, I didn't contradict him. We did it. We had won. Chapter 19 I blinked. Married. Now. It sounded crazy. Completely illogical. Something only crazy people did. I was a lot of things, but a crazy person wasn't one of those things. And yet. Why did my heart skip a beat at the thought? It wasn't planned, but I had never considered getting married before meeting Christian. It wasn't as though I had daydreamed about this moment because I hadn't. Maybe, maybe this could work. I knew I wanted to marry Christian. There was a reason I'd fought tooth and nail to acquire these rights. Part of it was because the wolves deserved to be treated as equals. They deserved to have the same rights as everyone else did. That much was a given. But I'd be lying if I said that was the only reason why I was doing this. Christian was the crux of everything. Of every decision I made, of everything I felt. It wasn't something I understood completely, because it didn't make sense to put so many of my eggs in one basket. On the other hand, it made perfect sense to my heart. It felt right. And the thought of marrying Christian now. That felt right too. All right, I said slowly, though my lips curved up into a grin and I couldn't stop myself from practically beaming. Let's do it. Christian's brows rose, like he didn't quite expect me to go along with it. I thought I'd have to do a better job of convincing you, he said. You never have to convince me to marry you, I told him, my tone serious, even if my cheeks pinched with a smile. I do it whenever, wherever. Just say the word. Christian smirked. Word. Pardon me, but did I just hear you say you're getting married? Oliver asked, popping up from seemingly nowhere. Somehow, I didn't think he just happened to drop by. I wouldn't be surprised if he had been there the whole time, listening in. Well? Christian asked, tilting his head in that endearing way of his that always left me breathless. Yes, I said. We are. Oliver clapped his hands. Perfect, he said. I've always been fond of weddings. Let's see. We need flowers, good food of course. An open bar. He snapped his fingers. We need someone to marry you. For sure, a critical element. Do you know anyone who might be ordained and willing to jump into marrying you? Oliver asked, looking between the two of us. I glanced over at Christian. He glanced over at my father. What about your dad? I looked over to where father stood, speaking to one of the wolf leaders. I was surprised when I took him in, a few scratches on his cheek, seeming to favor his left side, but other than that, it looked as though he hadn't been terribly affected by the battle. In fact, if it weren't for those scratches, there was a good chance no one would know he had fought at all. My eyes widened in realization. I knew my father was powerful, but I just didn't realize how powerful. Ah, he said. Bella. He glanced back at the shifter. Would you excuse me, Tobias? The shifter nodded. Of course. He disappeared the second my father turned to give us his complete attention. Before I could control myself, I threw my arms around him, hugging him close to my body. I was just so thankful he had survived. It was strange. I was used to life without him, and thanks to my mother's secrets, I didn't know anything about him until Ava went snooping. But I was so glad that changed. And I was so glad my mother had been wrong about him, 
even if she was justified in her caution. What's this, he asked with a chuckle. Didn't think I'd survive. I'm glad you did, I said. Because I need a favor. My father's lips turned up as he watched the two of us interact. A favor, you say, he asked. Didn't I assist in destroying the patriarchy of our world? What more could you possibly need from me? I giggled. Well, um, if it's not too trouble, can you marry Christian and me? Right now. My father gave me a long look. If that's what you truly wish, my Bella, I'd be honored. He placed a comforting hand on my shoulder and gave it a gentle squeeze. I glanced at myself in the mirror I'd conjured up, so I could make sure I looked presentable. I never understood the tradition of the white dress, but I managed to conjure one that wasn't quite white, more of an eggshell color. It had a scoop neck but wasn't cut down too far, and there was a red lace ribbon placed just underneath my breasts to emphasize my waist. It was the only color I had on, one I wore for Christian, for the wolves. I used my magic to knot my hair in a fancy updo, with stray tendrils falling into my face, framing it. Then I focused on my makeup, highlighting my eyes, my cheeks, my lips, while still somehow managing to make it look natural. I almost didn't recognize myself. But it wasn't the dress or the makeup or the hair. It was the confidence. Even now, I could still feel the power inside me, like a light at the end of the tunnel. Reminding me that it was here just in case I needed to reach it, needed to access it, like a dependable friend. Something inside of me warmed at the thought. Originally, I had been frightened at the prospect of the magic because I didn't understand it and I definitely couldn't control it. But now, now it was part of me. And I couldn't be afraid of something that wanted to help me. Someone cleared their throat, and I made out a silhouette behind the sheet. A familiar one. Come in, I called. My father swept in, regal robes billowing behind him. It had to be some kind of spell. The last time I had seen him, he had had a few tears in his clothing, and more than a little dirt of the hem of his robes. Now, he looked like he hadn't just fought an important battle. He looked like he had gotten dressed for my wedding. Even more tears filled my eyes. They're waiting, he said. He reached out and cupped my cheek. Ah, Bella, I'm so very proud of you. Stop, I said with a smile. I don't want to cry. Not today. You. Cry. My father patted my cheek. I didn't think it was possible. Only when it makes sense to, I teased back. A swell of music could be heard just outside of the tent. My heart skipped a beat at the sound. It seems they're ready for us. My father offered his arm. And you, Bella. Are you ready to get married? I took his arm. Absolutely. The wedding went by much too quickly. All I could see the whole time was Christian, the way his eyes got glassy as he watched me walk down the aisle on my father's arm, how he took my hand securely in his after my father presented me to him, and the way he couldn't stop smiling as my father continued the ceremony. When my father insisted we kiss, I didn't hesitate. I lunged for him. The crowd laughed and cheered. Someone whispered and I was certain it was Oliver. But the noises faded away until it was just the two of us. Bella, he said in a low voice once we pulled away. You never cease to amaze me. You're beautiful. Our children will be lucky to have you as their mother. This time I did cry. I couldn't help it. I was happy. This was where my life began. This was a new, unexplored adventure, and I was ready to take it. With Christian by my side, I knew we could endure anything thrown our way. As long as we were together. Epilogue One week later. We received word that Ava was in labor, so immediately set travel plans to get to her. Christian and I went straight to the Adunulfi realm, and despite my grandparents' insistence that no one but our blood relatives could enter, my husband had no issue. It seemed that my father's blessing over our union made a lot of magical difference. When we knocked on Clarissa's door, I wasn't sure what to expect, but hope and fear warred within me. The door opened and there stood my beautiful sister. Courtney. Bella, 
she whispered, her eyes red and puffy like she'd been crying. You came. Of course I came. I ran at her, wrapping my arms around my beloved younger sister and holding her tightly. I've never left you. I'm always here. It broke my heart, and hot tears sprung to my eyes to think that she'd ever thought such a thing. When I pulled back there were tears in her eyes, you got married without me. Aghast, I pulled Christian over to stand beside me. We got married out of pure necessity, my sister. When we get mated in a big party in front of the whole pack, you and Ava will be there. I promise. Christian opened his arms to Courtney, hello sister. She flew into my husband's arms, sobbing her heart out. I glanced into the cottage to see Clarissa standing back, a sad smile on her face. She didn't speak, but since time was of the essence, I called out to her. We need to take Courtney to the Fey realm. Can she travel? Courtney pulled her head up off Christian's chest, her tears drying. Why? What's happened? Ava's in labor. Courtney swiped the tears from her face. We need to go. We do, I said with a grin, Courtney was sounding stronger by the moment. That's why we're here. We didn't want you to miss out. Courtney twirled and raced back to Clarissa, and after a few heated whispers, she raced back. Okay. I can go. I glanced up at our cousin, who also nodded. She can. But any headaches or signs of poisoning, and she needs to come straight back. Deal, I agreed, linking my arm with my sister's. I've missed you. Courtney nodded but didn't respond. I assumed it was because she didn't want to cry again, now that she'd pulled herself together. Clarissa came forward finally and smiled up at Christian. I'm Clarissa, by the way. He chuckled and extended his hand. I know. My apologies, I'm... Christian. The wolf shifter who married my pure blood cousin. Clarissa joked with a giggle. You've got the whole realm up in arms. Not me, of course. She shrugged. You two found love. I'm happy for you. I stared at my cousin for a moment, suddenly realizing that she might be lonely. Do you want to come with us? You could see Ava, keep an eye on Courtney. Clarissa's eyelids dropped as she avoided my gaze. Thank you but no. I don't leave this realm. I opened my mouth to ask why that was, but Courtney elbowed me in the side, effectively stopping the words before they began. Let's go Bella. You're right. Well, see you soon Clarissa. We waved off our cousin and ran for the portal entrance. We'd coordinated a trip straight to Ferry from here. Not an easy transition, but it would be the quickest path. Let's go, I said, swiping the card over the veil, then nodding at my pale but still beautiful baby sister. She took a deep breath, straightened her spine, and walked straight through the portal. You're next, I said to Christian, glancing behind me. I don't trust half my family not to lock you in here if I go through first. Christian chuckled, ducked his head, and headed through the portal. My husband disappeared and I shook my head. My husband. I still wasn't used to that. I pushed through the cold puddle of shimmering silver light and stepped through the silence into fairy. The air was cool on my face but the sun was shining. The forests here were unlike anything I'd ever seen. The trees were tall and lush, the ground itself vibrating with an ancient magic. Let's go Bella. Courtney called out already running through the forest towards the small fey town where Ava had hidden from the council all those many months ago. I jogged after her, Christian slowing to let me keep up. Excited, he asked. I managed to say, yes. We ran all the way into town, where the fey lined the streets, silent as the trees around us. Where's Ava? Courtney asked the first fey man that she saw. He pointed towards a cabin to the left of us. We bolted for the door, a long painful wail meeting our ears. My heart squeezed hard but I didn't stop. My sister needed me. I pushed open the door, and there was Ava on the bed, sitting up with Tavlor behind her, holding her hands. She wore a thin white shirt and little else, her huge belly swollen and her face red and covered in sweat. I bolted for the bed, climbing onto the mattress and crawling up next to her. Her shaking stopped and she collapsed against Tavlor, panting hard. You came. 
Why did my sisters keep saying that to me? Had they believed I'd abandon them when I joined the pack? I hadn't. Not in my heart. Of course I came. You're my family, Ava. My blood. I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. Me neither, Courtney said, coming up onto the bed on the other side of Ava. Oh God, Ava cried, panic crossing her face. Here comes another one. Sit up, Ava, Tavlor said. I can't, she wailed and continued to cry out through the next contraction. I reached for her free hand and gripped it hard, squeezing back when her arm shook with attention. When she finally stopped crying out, she collapsed back against Tavlor once more. I stared at him. What should we do? We need to get her up, or on her knees at least. She needs to be able to push but she's too tired. She sobbed loudly and I pushed my empathy away. We needed to help. This was why we were here. Ava. Roll over. I gripped her hand and pulled, encouraging her to roll onto her knees. Finally she did, groaning as she went. Where's the midwife? I asked. Tavlor shook his head. There is none. Faye give birth alone. I groaned. Of course they did. Well, mom did it three times by herself, Ava. And you have Tavlor here. You can do it. She nodded her head and sobbed. I gestured to Tavlor to come down the end of the bed. You catch the baby. Courtney and I will help Ava. I wasn't sure if magic should be used, but I bent close and whispered to my sister, I'm going to take away some of the pain, okay? Just enough so you can focus on getting this baby out, Ava. We've lost enough family already. We are not losing you. I cast a gentle spell over my sister, running my hand down her spine, sharing my love for her with the incantation. Ava sighed and dropped her head into the bed. I'm here too. Ava, Courtney said, stroking Ava's long hair back from her sweaty face. Court, can you tie her hair up? Courtney glanced up at me and nodded, flicking her hand over Ava's head, using magic to sweep her long blonde hair up into a bun. That's better. She crooned at our sister. Ava began to cry out, pushing her arms into the bed and arching backwards. This time you're going to push, okay? Not too hard, just shift the baby a little, okay? She nodded, groaning out a guttural noise as she pushed back. Breathe, I reminded her, running my hand down her sweaty back and casting another soft spell to ease her pain. Ava collapsed forwards again and Tavlor called out, I can see the head, Ava. You're doing so well. Ava turned her head and glanced up at me. I moved closer so I could hear her speak. Thank you. I smiled back. It's all you, Ava. I'm sorry we weren't here sooner. She shifted around, moving her legs to get into a better position, then when the next pain hit, she pushed again. This time she cried out in pain. The head's out, Tavlor gasped. One more should do it. I gripped my sister's hands and whispered to her, take a moment. Your baby is safe. They're almost here. You're safe. We're here. Ava took a few deep breaths then pushed hard. There was a slither and a cry, and my nephew was here. I glanced back to see him, safe and squirming in his father's arms. I shared a teary smile with Tavlor, before bending over to kiss my sister's face. You did it, Ava. She took a moment to collect herself, then pushed up and rolled over once more, her belly flattening already. Courtney moved the pillows around so that Ava could lie back comfortably. Ava held out her arms to Tavlor. Is it a boy? He nodded. Yes. I chuckled, realizing the importance of the moment. The next high warlock of the realms. Ava reached for her baby, and Tavlor carefully transferred him into his mother's arms. He was wet and red, with chubby cheeks that made me want to kiss him. He's beautiful, Ava. Hello, beautiful boy, she whispered, holding him close. I stepped back as Courtney conjured a blue crocheted blanket and laid it over mother and son. I'll step out and give you three a minute. I nodded at Courtney, who bowed out as well, leaving behind me. Christian was outside, leaning against a tree. The Fae surged forward, worry written on their faces. She's okay, 
I reassured them. Tavlor and Ava have a son. A cheer went up around the forest just as my father came hurrying down the path. I just heard. I'm so sorry I'm late. He hugged me first, then Courtney. Is Ava all right? I nodded, smiling brightly at him with nothing but pure joy in my heart. She is. Give them a minute, then go meet your grandson. I have they. Dad's eyes filled with tears as he turned towards the cottage. Yes. I squeezed his arm as he wandered towards my sister's birthing house. I reached out for Christian's hand and grinned. The next generation is here. I wish my mom was around to see it. Christian stepped behind me and wrapped his arms around my waist. I wish she was here too. I would have loved to meet her. Courtney sighed. She would have kicked our asses for what's happened so far. I couldn't help but laugh and close my eyes, nestling into my husband's warmth. So true. The end. This is the last of Bella's stories, but Courtney is next. Pre-order book 7, here.